Hello, everybody. It's your wonderful wind maid, your true ship servant, Chartreuse Fratzi, ever and always at your service here. How are we doing today, everybody? Today is Saturday, July 13, and a little bit less than a week away from what would be my one-year anniversary of releasing Captivating, an in-depth guide on how to play Rasmus, everybody. This is Omega Strikers, or Saturday Night, no, Saturday Night Striking, rather. But the main thing that I want to highlight is exactly so. Yes, we are actually so close to the one-year anniversary of what really brought me to creating more content for Omega Strikers and everything in general, quite frankly. So I want to give my love back to everybody who supported me on that end for getting me across the line with, of course, 700 almost going on 800 more followers and everything like that and exactly so getting onwards with a one year to my most viewed video of all time breaking 100 was an, an honor to me breaking a thousand was great going up to 8,000 and then even getting Lutzbird the primary designer of Rasmus himself to acknowledge my efforts and all was a real big treat and I can't say anything more than that but just Wow, that's so cool, and I'm so happy and thrilled to be able to support Omega Strikers in one, in one little cornerstone of mine. Even if, uh, what's his face? Even if <laughs> I really don't get to interact. I say I don't get to, that's, that is very, very diminishing when I deliberately just happen to, just on my own laziness, to interact with the main Discord or any other community member, any other, like, streamers with Omega Strikers. It's just me staying in my little corner and just saying, yeah, I'm enjoying my side. But yeah, main thing I want to do today is I'm going to go on with my usual games afterwards in the competitive ladder, but to start the night off, I thought I'd devote maybe a good hour is what I'm expecting to go through here because it's a 20 minute video but I want to break down both my design process with making this video and also my retrospective on what I think I could have improved upon it at the time. Because my journey into Omega Strikers was... I remember I had an inkling back when it was in early beta or so, back when it was still trainings actually, not awakenings. So you choose your training to load out instead of having the awakening draft path that I remember. And then there was also all the creator stuff, stuff uh, creator cup stuff that really got the ball rolling with my growing interest. So back then I played Aimee, but it was only then after Rasmus came out that I really did start in supporting. Now, of course, I transitioned my mains over mostly then because, uh, well, Connor voices him, C.VA, and we got that dodge in him. That's quite literally the only justification on what got me to maining this boy here. And, well, it's carried me over to, I'd say, my corner of fame in the community. But yeah, let's break down what I covered in the video, what I feel like I've improved with my Rasmus, slash taking advice on from other people, so or watching pros play him, and what I would consider to be improvements that I could make if I ever wanted to make a follow-up video. Do I think I'd want to make an in-depth follow-up video to this i don't have the time to edit and do everything like that unfortunately maybe in another world i would be able to but at least for where we are here uh i don't think i don't think i'd be able to i have debated about going back to doing the school of omega strikers because there's a few other things that i would like to cover as general tips or so but it's getting more into the niche stuff kind of like uh uh, kind of like lining up to be a second defensive line, for instance, or understanding or, or understanding energy gain itself. I think those are important topics, but they're kind of on the back burner just because I don't have all the time in the world, once again, with my two-job situation and other family things. So, could be there, but if I get more vocal support on it, then I think I would put myself on the radar for saying, yeah, let's continue that series. But as far as I saw last time around, I spent so much time putting into the hour and a half on the Awakenings video, and I really didn't get that much return on investment. So, already thinking about that being like what I thought was a general topic, since Awakenings are always prevalent, and I barely broke, I think barely broke 100, compared to how Dribbling I think broke 2k, and then my other lessons of man marking and waiting to strike didn't really do too well otherwise, if I remember. Let me, well, let me fat check myself on... <laughs> 
on my YouTube studio before I go on with that, actually. School of Omega Strikers. Let's see here. My initial announcement video got 371 views. Dribbling broke 2k. Man marking actually is at 600. Striking with intense at 600. Okay. Awakens at 500. Okay. Actually, not that bad, but. Uh, at the time, I just remember at the, uh, I'm just saying it's more residual, because at the time, it, like, I remember just seeing the metrics, and, like, a month passed, uh, two months passed, Awakening, Draft, and Striking Within did not break 100 at all, so that may be okay. I am a little bit more incent incentivized now, but at the moment, once again, on the bat burner. But yeah, let's just go through this thing here. Let's go through, uh, Captivating and see what I would like to note on it. I can do a reaction thumbnail on this actually thinking about it. <laughs> Rasmus is a captivating playmaker. Oh my god, a yo. capable midfielder who can control the court from nearly anywhere on the pitch, enabling unique plays that no other striker can accomplish. Okay, let's cover two things here real quick. I remember uh, because I wanted to make this a very accessible video, I went through and manually put the closed captioning on. I went through every single second. And instead of just letting it be auto-generated, I, I, because I know I have my Wisp, I went through every, like, every five seconds, every ten seconds, making sure that whenever I finished a beat in my script, I wrote down the entire line so that everybody could understand it. This is, like, the only video that I've done it for. I haven't done it for any of my other ones. So, sorry to everybody else who might have had trouble understanding me in my school of Omega Strikers. I do apologize for that. But at least for this high effort video, I did put a lot of effort into it. Uh, going on to other things though, uh, immediate first thing that I just want to nitpick at myself here. I say capable midfielder because I, back then, love magnetized souls and I still very much so do, but I do recognize that Rasmus probably benefits from sweat kits the most if you are going to be doing forward business just on a general basis. Of course, Pummel's on Imi Zap, Vicious on Atlas's lab does go around, and Rasmus does benefit better from being, all right, uh, uh, can transition from midfield to forward considering how 1-2 pendulum swings like I cover later on very much so do translate pretty well. But at least at the time when I was playing Rasmus the most, I found the best success with being a midfielder because I was very confident in my play and I'll, I feel at the time when it was, remember, this is season one. Uh, this is beta sauce season one content that I got my, my that I got my clips from. It was really, well, I say, I say beta. Nah, it's really just season one. But it was a lot of people not being as confident to challenge, I guess, at the midfield line with their face. So I got to really thrive there. Nowadays, Rasmus can still succeed, but people have gotten better at cheating past with ranged abilities or with just understanding how to hold the core dribble better or so. Not saying that he can't do it, but Rasmus honestly can succeed at any position. He's a great goalie, he can midfield pretty well, he can forward pretty well. Depends on how you like to play him, but at the time of recording, I like to play Rasmus the most at midfield. I feel like I still kind of do, because I'm not the most confident when it comes to clinically finishing. Or rather, I'm not the most clinically clean, rather, with setting up my combos. But don't take that exact wording of a capable midfielder to heart. Because I have gotten some comments in the past saying, you know, he can say, really? Is Rasmus only a midfielder? No, he succeeds at every role. But at least for me, I play him the best. And I do say so that can control the tour from nearly anywhere on the pitch. That was supposed to be more indicative of saying he can transition anywhere your goal line midfield, their goal, I'm sorry, their goal line slash goal mouth, and succeed pretty well, just by whatever position he is in. And then otherwise, there we go, there's just the uh, Rasmussen. My name is Chartreuse Pratsy. Oh my god, so look at how young I was! I've been VTubing for four years, oh my goodness, I'm old, I'm a prehistoric VTuber, everybody. I was there back when the boom first happened, y'all. Been VTubing since 2020, and that is only model number two just about for me. Still love that very much, but of course I have evolved with time. So, if I ever did go back there, it'd be funny to see that. But yeah, that was me back then, guys. Avid Rasmus main and devout lover of the whole. Okay, I have no idea what incensed me to make that meme, I'll be honest with you there. But I just felt like I had to have another... I thought that I had to have another resume done. <laughs> I 
rather than just avid Rasmus main. I'll be watching you see exactly how I like to play the captivating playmaker in Omega Strikers. For my own reference points here, I am currently top 800 in the world Two. and top 300 in North America at the time of this video's recording. I remember that I was getting Rasmus clips throughout the uh, uh, throughout captivating. But I'm sorry, I'm sorry, throughout um, the design process of captivating, but only when I did hit Challenger for the first time in season one did I feel like I had the authority to speak on the subject. Now that is of course not a bar. Anybody can speak from its. Uh, anybody can speak on their own experiences with how, making a guide, because otherwise, how else are you gonna inspire the people to get better and push your character? Of course. But for me, I feel that was just a kind of a pride point of being able to say, hey, I need to showcase that I can talk the talk. Especially since Rasmus was, I think, the only difficulty 3 striker. Let's see, is Runa difficulty 3? Either way, Rasmus was the newest character in the block when season 1 came out. And I wanted to prove that, hey, I can back up what I'm saying here with arguable fads. I am top 1000 in the world, baby. All of the clips that you see here today will be taken exactly from my stream and mostly from the mid to high diamond range for what you will be expecting for skill level today. I'll be going through each of Rasmus' core abilities today, so Whiplash, Pendulum Swing, and Death Touch, alongside a few awakenings that you might want to consider next time you pick up this striker. So, without further ado, let's start with Whiplash. I spent a good amount of time trying to crop Rasmus' hair for this whiplash here. And sadly, I've gotten people talk about the death touch and the pendulum swing intro cards, but nobody's talked about whiplash. Come on, guys! That's a good it's a really good movie I'm referencing here. Using whiplash effectively Oh so uh Uniol, so us Unis so us Uniclear, so us Uniol 2 or Uni 2. Soundtrack, my beloved. Is knowing about where you want to aim first and foremost. You're looking to always carry the core to one of the corners of the enemy goal mount. You can use your haste to get across from the midfield to the mouth, and then you want to cut off as many passing angles, controlling your side of the field. I feel like that advice that I have right there holds up pretty well, all things considered here. I think it just mostly goes down to more being able to control your corners. Just that's more holding core priority more than anything. But of course, if you have if you don't have sword kits, whiplash makes up for it. If you do have sword kits, then paired with whiplash, of course, you are going to be a speeding bullet and can effortlessly hold control since you always have a one-two strike at any time. And then you go, being able to go up and down the midfield was once again my. Madden Ty's Souls brain really perking up then and there, but also season one, of course, people are just going to, uh, people were grouping up a lot more, people were just hodgepodging, ping ponging more. So I think it hasn't aged necessarily the best, this piece of advice here, but it is just showcasing hey, you can go from corner to corner, uh, up, uh, up to down, uh, uh, up, uh, up to down, top to bottom, bottom to top of the midfield without any worry for the whole duration. You want to cut off as many passing angles, controlling your side of the field. I do think that at the time here, it was built different in Big Fish, not counting Power of as your only size traits. So I didn't really get to harp on how Rasmus's size benefits the most until Awakening Draft later on, if I remember. Yeah, okay, I do, but I have that more in Pendulum Swing and a little bit in Whiplash, as you can see there. But I should have highlighted more on how being able to increase your size means you are cutting off more and more angles every single time. Actually, no, I think, okay, actually, wait, I'm, no, I'm, I'm racking through my brain here. I think I compartmentalized it into the Awakening draft. So, really, it's a good on a rewatch, but I'm thinking I'm trying to take this from a beginner angle. So, Every yeah, yeah, yeah. You whiplash, you're trying to make the most use out of both parts of the ability, the dash and the strike. Also, can I just say, at the beginning of this, that is a dash tried and true Chargers Fratsy rubber banding bad internet right there. The but, sample enough, that's just showing, hey, you have a 1-2 strike with uh, with you know Whiplash your and your strike itself. Uh, recast strike. and Whiplash. Whiplash to get your haste and beat defenders. Then, recast when you're in front of the goalie to easily contest them with your increased range. Yeah, Whiplash itself 
right there was to guarantee that I get the first hit, and then second hit just is one to strike overall. Basically, just having two timings to beat the enemy on. Also, I think that is magnetized proting right there. Let's 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 look at that. Yeah, yeah. Look at that magnetized. Magnetized soul is getting me across the midfield line, baby. So what kids would have done the same and better, honestly. But once again. That was my season one. I just magnetized all the time. I said I am midfield here. Yeah, increased range was really what I was talking about there. Since I want, uh, since I tried pushing the idea about then of one twos, you know, the flip wash and being able to yeah challenge at their face, because the exactly so. Space. Having that little extra range is what I is what I prioritized in my first review of the video more than one uh, more than the one two which I think I did cover. I haven't watched my videos in forever either, so I can't say. But the main thing that it comes down to increased strains means you are forcing the goalie to make a decision and you are cutting off the angles from where their forwards are. You're putting the pressure on them since instead of you just challenging with your face, you're challenging with a bigger circle. You can cover essentially half of the field if you get close enough. And force out these unwinnable situations if they're not prepared for it. Yep. Got the goal wide open? Remember to strike for the corners of the enemy goal mouth when you're looking to recast Whiplash. The key is to always put it in the center of your own body. That way you can cut off as many passing angles for the goal. Yep. That holds up pretty well. Uh, putting it into the corner means that when uh, when the core bounces back to you, it's inside your whole body. So if they don't have a stun, if they don't have a creation, if it's not a Dubu, if it's not like uh, if it's not a Dubu or so, even if it's like let's say a Kai Barrage in this instance or so, it's gonna be inside. It's like when the core bounces to you right there, you're trying to you're trying to stand on top of it. You can eat maybe a few pellets or so. You have whipwash. The exact range to drag it anywhere else, and then you still have your own strike to challenge otherwise. So even when it comes to, you it's still have a one-two more Whereas often than not. Able to burn Kai's core flip, and after a pass, I'm able to... But the main power with it, of course, though, is exactly so. When you bring it to the corner, you are forcing the enemy to have to pass in an unfavorable situation, because instead of them having two corners to work towards, they only have one far-off corner, which you are... Uh, which Hopefully your fellow forward is going to cover, put them in a bad passing situation, whereas you are already covering the other side and maybe even more of the midfield line, if you have your other abilities up. Get a deceptively simple whiplash goal. In reality, it's all thanks to a forced situation. Notice how I'm pushing the core towards the corner of his goal mouth. Nobody is on the bottom half of my field and that is my territory. Kai recognizes this and tries to speed up with blazing pace to clear it upwards, but my increased strange means that before he even arrived, he already lost the fight. Exactly so. Well said, me from the past. Just simply, that's... I, I feel like I guess that's more recognizing the state of play with, all right, where's the enemy weak? There's nobody at the bottom right. But it's also just good rule of thumb. If you're going to drive the core anywhere else, you, if, you, if you need to just clear the core and reset it into a situation where you need to wait a second or two for your ability and you're not confident in your dribbling or you're being pressured out, just putting it in a corner away from everybody else to where either your goal can get to it first or to where it's going to force people to move down and away means that you can then leverage your range, your abilities or so, or whatever your striker is good at. At least for Erasmus right then and there, of course, I'm dragging it down to where I can benefit, one, magnetized souls, ha ha ha, and two, whip washes range, exactly so, keeps covering the entire bottom half, because Kai, with no energy, probably with no digit blast from just how he had to burn boys in place to get down there, no barrage either, guessing so, then he just can only pass up, and exactly so, bad situation, bad situation, because he literally can't do much else. But, my increased range means that before he even arrived, he already lost the fight. Always, always, always be looking to get in between the goalie and his forwards whenever your team is on the offensive, so you can force these 1v1 battles of attrition. This one here is just really state of play. If you're going to cover the bottom half or like where the core is not on the map, yeah, just off the ball movement, recognizing when you can find a cut in with your speed here. Now, this is, of course, trusting that the core can get to you, but it's just also a lesson in, all right, you got your one-two. Whiplash, recast, 
pushes the core out with the extended range, that way Kai is forced to strike he right here, he strikes next, and Does then strike. you have your immediate strike, uh, and then you have your regular strike. So, recast, Kai strikes, you strike. Simple enough right there. Forcing him with your extended range to have to make that decision right then and there. But that's just more, uh, so I guess if I pointed out that was a 1-2 in a vacuum, maybe that could have been a little bit better, but... This was still my one year in, and this is my first ever died video I've ever done. Not to mention, like, good, like, actual law form of content if you don't count Core Strike Thief and the Rasmus' Treasure at the time. So, I do believe there's a lot more in depth I could have gone, but I just wanted to get my basic point across as I had my clips, I titled them out saying, Whiplash Example 1, Whiplash Example 2, and I ran with it, I remember. Even if you can't get directly in front of the goalie's face, you should always be looking to push the offensive whenever you have Whiplash up, alternating your basic strike with your recast. Okay, yeah, I do say- I do it. I do say that. Oh, well, it's coming back to me here, but I didn't say 1-2s. Kind of like a 1-2 dash punts or 1-2 pendulum swing, necessarily. Right. I think it said called it bread and butter, because since I used the uni soundtrack, I was thinking FGC mindset. Strike again. Yeah, strike, recast, goals. strike again. That's 1-2-3 right dribbling. there. Usually to dribble successfully, you'd need about a third of the field. But with Whiplash, you can cut down your distance to about a fourth, which does have its impact in certain situations. This little segment right here, because I remember somebody pointing out how being able how being able to dribble with Rasmus was so important, that's actually what inspired me to do School of Omega Strikers, funny enough. Because somebody pointed that out, and also because I was getting frustrated at people in my games who could not understand how to deal with dribbling, nor could they dribble at all, it was just ping-ponging. So I think that really pushed me over the edge when I realized that this just little segment of Whiplash in the video here really drew actual, some actual good heads to turn. Part, utilizing dribbling with my strike and recast allows me to get a clean goal while keeping it away from the enemy forwards. Oh, what a clean key goal, thing to dude. Note here is when I time my initial activation. I'm able to beat Aimee before she can reach the core. She, before she can reach the core, not only to whiplash, but we both have magnetized souls here. What? Once again, the season one art for Cruzy. And then keep it on my corner of the field. This is just She's clinical. To touch it with her own very, very clinical. You see Aimee try to strike right then and there. Right, but I because I can just hold it too, it gets a lot harder. Or get well, I'd say it's just a lot harder. She just loses the war straight up. So there's no way that she can really do too much more. Also, the Marth Pendulum Brain Swing. Ah, oh, I love this. It's so stupid. Alright, let's talk Pendulum Swing. You'll want to get used to comboing your strike and your pendulum swing one after another. Like a Julia dash punch. Oh uh, yeah, I do cover it one twos. The first and obvious use of it is that you'll always be hitting the sweet spot of your pendulum swing. I feel when I get to the awakening draft later, one thing I really actually don't highlight on this is that since it is a one two, there is definitely a lot of trades that do benefit from this end. Be it one two punch specifically because you're hitting the core twice over. Hot shot is really, really nice for that end since you're going to be sending it with, or you're already hitting the sweet spot of pendulum swing and you're going to be sending it in the core, hopefully towards the enemy goal mouth. Team player, ironically enough, can sometimes help out. Well, actually, I don't know if it works. I'm sorry. I, I, well, depends on situation more more than anything. Every now and then to help shore it up for when you can find your sense. But really, one two punch. Hot shot, and then, funny enough, heavy impact. I think I put some emphasis on it. Uh, let me start on over. Yeah, I, I do put emphasis on heavy impact. Since you are going to be looking, hitting the tour and stunning any, anybody, you're going to be sending it further. Just that extra speed is my, is the first point I harped on, I remember. Straight pendulum swing. Straight pendulum swing. This is going to be a pretty essential core in your bread and butter kit. Yeah, bread and butter. That's what I did say. So you better get used to practicing it. The burst of speed may not seem like much, but this can actually beat out some goalies' dashes, like Asher's, if you're quick enough. I know that for the two clips there, I highlighted how Rune didn't get a chance to clip the core with his burst, and then Asher, of course, didn't actually reach the core despite her shield dash. But I do think, I do believe that this it shouldn't just only be used for the speed, but also just for recognizing that it can you could hit the person trying to defend where the core is going. And I didn't get any clips of it at the time, just because I think I'm bad at the game. Hey there, Kappa. Austin, hope you all are doing well. So, at the time of recording, it wasn't a priority to me, I don't think, just because, hey, 
that's really, uh, that really just never came up to me and I wasn't good enough for Asmus. I do have the moment where I tripped the goalie at the end, but that was a freak accident more than anything, I feel. Secondly, Pendulum Swing offers itself as a great brute force option against the goalie. Oh, look, look at that horrible dribbling game, dude. I, I just want to highlight that real quick. Good pendulum swing right there. Ping pong, because I don't know what to do. Dribble up to, I'd say pass up to Aimee, who's so close to me, she's not going to be able to react to the core at all. Oh, that's so disgusting to see. The key here is to look at where the goalie and the core are going to intersect with each other in their path. So, I say that as in just watch for the core and let the core naturally make its way over after a strike. When I definitely could have said for uh, for understanding mastery of the character in Asmus, and also just in general for playing the game, to strike and hit the goalie with pendulum swing. Uh, sorry, to strike the core in a direction, and then pendulum swing to hit the goalie and the core 1-2 style. But instead, I think my wording definitely wasn't the best. Because I said, you're already going to be sending the core, uh, you're already going to be directing the core in one direction. I could have said, you're already striking the core in one direction. Hit the, uh, hit, uh, hit it with pendulum swing right after. Directing core in one direction, wherever the sweet spot is. So just want to hit the goalie as your main focus. Dude, what a Once pendulum swing barrier, stupidity right now there. Now it's time to use the rest of your kit to finish what you started. At the very least, that's a that's a perfect whiplash example right afterwards. Barrier, but bad, bad play by me. Finish what you started. Yeah, just one, two striking on Duvu like that, and simple enough. Once the core is already headed in the correct direction, all you need to do is space yourself properly. Now that one right there, exactly so, the was just w waiting for the core to actually come around, and then doing so. Because they didn't, you didn't need you to strike at that point. I mean, I could strike it, uh, strike and then buffer input, but quite frankly, it still got the point across. You're always looking to stun, 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 which was the main crux of my point at the time. Mindset of treating pendulum swing like a range strike, aiming past the forwards and hitting the sweet spot in a direction where the goalies won't be able to cover it. So exactly so, I think this is the underrated thing that people always forget about. This is why Rasmus always shines, is it is a effective range strike and the fact that it can stun the enemies contesting it where it is, is so important. That's how Rasmus always gets to thrive. In, uh, instead of uh, you just run up to uh, you run up when the core is making it to the midfield line and just hit somebody with pendulum swing. That's good damage as you're probably going to be taking powerhouse potions at all times. Unless you're Aimee Zap and then you just take strike shot if you want to really cheese and be stupid. But that's a different story. But the fact that is <laughs> that's a very that's a very jarring aside, Cruzy. Let's let's get back on here. But especially so like. You hold the midfield line as Rasmus. You don't let it cross back to you because you have your recast or so. But the fact is, you are looking to steal priority when you're playing goalie. And I, I approached this video as a pure forward because I didn't play Rasmus goalie. I didn't think it was viable back then. And also, I was weaning off my goalie art because I only played Aimee goalie. I played Fletz back then, but I only played Aimee goalie. Because a jet button, ha ha ha, I wanted to push up the line. So I, I remember seeing a lot of people who were saying they played goalie or Erasmus goalie at the time then. And it really made me feel sad that I wasn't able to, I, I wasn't able to properly highlight how Erasmus goalie can succeed. But one year later, very much so, fact is pendulum swing being a range strike, green's 1000% true. You steal priority from the enemy, you stun them, you send the core back to your forwards. Banana27 in chat says, Hey man, I've really been enjoying your YouTube vids and wanted to thank you for your love and passion for the game. Well, first and foremost, thank you for your first time chat as well. And also, I do see that you have been following me since two hours ago. So thank you very much for that. Let me chat. Did anybody else follow me? Uh, nobody recently then. Well, first and foremost, thank you for joining the cruise ship, friend. And thank you for the continued love. Guys, what's again? This video itself has been my most viewed, but on my Strikers continues to be the most successful content that I've had on my channel, pretty much all time or so, if, if I check my own metrics or so. What's up? What's popular? Yep, Core Strike Thief and Rasmus' Treasure. We have Mega Strikers. Okay, out of like my top 12, Hearthstone popped off for whatever reason, and then I had one, you know, Helldivers clip, but overall, my bigger long-form content has been better, not to mention even my earliest 
guide videos or so and showcasing cool builds and showcasing how to play Rasmus on different maps and everything like that or so or just once again yeah captivating 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 so just thank you for the continued support as always and hopefully this will be a good retrospective for everybody else on YouTube who can't make it to the stream today or when it does come out on the 18th but getting back to it or so yeah, I, I kept highlighting how it was a ranged strike, but I never highlighted how stunning it continues to be. The most polarizing thing, because I always highlight hard and soft forces, but it's the most important thing afterwards. And yeah, exactly so. Well, forward, if the highlighting the stun. To you, instead, wait for the right moment to stun the goalie as the core is being sent on its merry way. I said I haven't watched this video in forever, and yet every time I bring up a point, I immediately contradict myself by saying, Oh yeah, no, I did cover it. <laughs> hey. But yeah, that that's just that's more just uh, off the ball IQ I feel right then and there of being able to recognize hey it is a stun I do highlight it but I should have said stun 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 use pendulum swing as a uh, as a range strike or a uh, and slash or a stun. Instead, wait for the right moment to stun the doy as the core is being sent on its merry way. I do say stun right there, but strike and or stun would have been much more concise language. Pendulum swing can also be used to punish goalies who are standing too far into their own goal mouth. You can spot this KO opportunity by winding up the two corners of the enemy goal mouth while it's open. Pendulum swing has enough knockback on its sweet spot to KO any goalie in there. Goal mouth I felt open. like when I spotted this bat then, in my early days, I thought I figured out the hack. Now granted, remember, this is this is season one, so Flutz days. This is when Imi Joy was still in my mind. So I could very much so run up to midfield one, press a jet button if I saw somebody standing too far back, and then even maybe pr uh, sorry, sorry, cyber swipe and then maybe even glitch pop right afterwards to get them. Is even with the additional defensive traits that you have of reduced damage and not bat when you're in your own goal mouth. I really did think, all right, I will be running away with easy cheesy kills if I keep spotting where people are on the goal line. And this still does hold true, but I should have highlighted that one, two strikes would have been the best off of it. But counterpoints to that end, I don't think I got any clips of it back then, so I didn't highlight it. So I just put this point here as saying, haha, cool hatch. And Pendulum Swing with its big circular range, if people don't respect it, it's pretty good on that end, all things considered here. Plus, once again, Season 1 days, so people weren't as savvy to understand how far back they were standing in their own goal mouth. They didn't know how to push up as effectively. You want to treat it kind of like as if you're playing Kai Doi by aiming vertically directly up or downwards. Okay, I pulled up Omega Strikers itself on my monitor on the side here because i wanted to highlight this point specifically here the defensive feat of being able to just treat it as a range yeah i say to aim up or down like a tie barrage because that was the only characters i feel uh, that was the only character at the time who really had good mastery or rather people who really understood how to use their mastery that way it was that or a dread or a dread with lock and loads just going up or down, but you didn't see as many jets. You saw Kai's everywhere all the time, of course, as he's one of the initial unlocked characters. But being able to steal priority from a core that was coming your way, bad. And being able to steal priority from a core that was potentially coming your way or far out with a ranged pendulum swing was very, very huge and is a point that I feel that I didn't cover enough. Because when it comes to if the core was coming along, if the core was coming along on the bottom side of the map, and I'm not demonstrating this at all. Whenever the core was going down like A lane at the top or bottom, just due to an enemy being a uh, just due to an enemy dragging it back and forth one way or another, being able being able to both stun the enemy and force the core back up to you after let's say you're at the midfield line if juliet was holding the core and it just wasn't bouncing willy nilly just being able to stun her bounce the core back to you and then get whatever free play that you want off of that end is the biggest defensive merit more than just being able to say hey i'm presenting a line hitbots because it's only one second of instance that pendulum swings up here compared to kai's barrage which has four you know mini pellets or so that was the only clip I got back then, I remember, of showcasing how Pendulum Swing was. But once again, when it comes to the defensive line, Doi Rasmus, you hold the midfield just by being able to stun somebody going forward, uh, sorry, going forwards and trying to push the core more. Whereas if you're forward, yeah, exactly. If the core is down below at, uh, sorry, 
at a bottom lane or so, and you're holding the midfield, and they're trying to dribble it or pass it out to themselves, just stun the enemy, you will get, it'll pass back to you, just naturally, lazily drifting back up, you get free core control and everything past that end. That's the mastery end that I can vouch for, once again, one year later, but I only got the one clip back then, so I feel like I did neglect the Rasmus Saints when it came to really getting to highlight how good Pendulum Swing is as a defensive trait for being able to stun and also presenting a big line, even if it's a sour spot. By aiming vertically, directly up or downwards. Because exactly so, with it being a line, if she tries to pass up to Julie, it denies its way, or if she just goes straight, I've got my bigger hitbox itself from Pendulum Swing to really make an effort off of. Hello there, Jinjo. First and foremost, oh wait, I didn't, I didn't have things up. I forgot to swap over my browser. Well, highlight it again, highlight it again. You treat it kind of like as if you're playing Kai Goli by aiming vertically, directly up or downwards. Yeah, you can see right here, the, li the line. If it passes up, well, I don't think, I don't think the sour spot would have clipped it. But fact is, I'm still trying to cover as much ground as I can because Joy's at the bottom. Aimee's just holding neutral in the mid, uh, in the middle of the dual mouth. She has to, with just with her positioning. So I need to cover the top as much as I can. The only way I can do so is with a pendulum swing. And then, <laughs> whoa, death touched me upon ye. I'm very happy with this edit, but the only regret that I had is the only stretched portion of the map. I got the background from the Rasmus trailer, I remember, when I really wish I could have gotten Aimee's app, but there's no trailer footage on Aimee's app, so I couldn't just say, at, I couldn't actually have the whole be present in this image. It's just at the city, and I feel like a fraud, dude. I feel like a real big fraud when I look at it here. The value from Dev Touch is all about rewarding good positioning from you and punishing bad positioning from the enemy. You're trying to be in two places at once to where you can always set yourself up from a pass from your teammates or yourself. Rasmus can seamlessly transition from a midfielder to a forward with just one simple ability cast, and the goalies will hate him for it. I still do think that very much so holds. I mean, it's nothing more than just saying, yeah, Rasmus can succeed at any position. I think it's more just epitomous of Rasmus can succeed at any position. But once again, I played Magnetized Souls. I think I'm hard I think I've harped on this point enough. I thought roles were basically better set in stone, but as people get better, you need to just be able to flexibly transition between where you are on the pitch at all times. Always look for every opportunity whenever Death Touch is off cooldown to sight the opponent out with a cross map play. Now this point, I think, was the most important because in terms of major effectiveness, let's compare it to like Firewall Sentry or Tofu Fortress. Those are creations that linger, can get more than one hit, and will, uh, and will physically change how the map itself looks. Uh, Flame Fury from Juliet will get to hold the core, stalls her time, gives her, uh, gives her time to get her combos, or another way to KO the enemy. You have Giga Blast, which is its own ranged super stun and potential KO on the corner striking here. Death Touch is just one super powered Sonic core coming your way, if you land it or so. And I wanted to present the point here of saying, hey look, it is an ultimate ability, and it seems underwhelming on paper, which is why you need to just be using it off cooldown to steal priority as many times as you can on the play, and make sure that you always have control yourself. Good Death Touch use only comes from good observation and conditioning. You want to always keep your eyes on both enemy forwards and see how they like to strike or pass the core with each other. As soon as you find the opening, it's all about maintaining your position in the midfield where you're wide open to take the clean shot. Exactly so. Good Death Touch use is uh, is prevalent on being able to predict what the enemy wants to do in this vice. It's all about uh, in this in this clip here in this vice in this clip vice. Already was only just dribbling back and forth, and I had recognized this in this game here. But I think this is a bad example considering how I put the creation out early. Position in the midfield where you're wide because open. there's no real, there's not really any other lane. I'm man marking the other Rasmus, and I know she's just gonna ping pong it. But the main thing is, right, okay, I guess I did say conditioning first and foremost, but better mastery would be able to catch to just toss Death Touch and catch the core as Vice is hitting instead of letting it linger on the field. Because the Death Touch that lingers on the pitch that gets no use always feels bad. Being able to reaction test and predict on the fly is much better because if people see you cast the creation and then it just sits out there, well, that feels pretty awkward, don't you think, of it just 
sitting there, now they can respect it like a Juno Bravo, like an Atlas Astral Projection, like any other creation or so. But season one days. The offense, it's time to start tracking the enemy goalie's behaviors. It can be hard to intercept passes to their teammates, so you want to pay attention to any time they try to clear on the corners of their goal and adjust your positioning accordingly. So I like hear about then. This is just me saying it can be hard to see how I say it can be hard to position yourself around where the enemies are. No, that's just a skill issue on my end. I should have said something more proactive and, and encourage people to say, hey, March the enemy passing lanes out, but then again, I wasn't thinking about Stool of Momentous Strikers at the time when I was making this. I was only thinking about captivating at all. So, I should have been able to say instead, hey, if you're cutting down the passing lanes, you force the enemy to pass on their goal uh, on their corners, and then that's when you can really condition them further, further out. Now, the big thing though is very much so adjust uh, adjusting your positioning, because you can see here. As I see that Aimee has full control of the core, I, there's two options. I could have done a Pendulum Swing right then and there if I recognized it to just steal priority and then just get a through ball. But I instead, in, in this play here, I instead so opted to go down, let Aimee have full control of the core, and instead adjust myself to be in the middle so I have as many lanes to send the core after I get the Death Touch pass. That was just me recognizing, yeah, she's in the corner, I'm in front of Juno at the very most, so nobody's threatening me, and while well, Juliet's checking out our dread. So instead, just immediately steal priority. That's better conditioning, because I catch the core right with my Death Touch without it letting Linger in the field at all. It goes out, it nabs the core, and then I send it on its merry way. That's just effective, effective plays right there. More than the conditioning, but also recognizing the state of play, which is what I think is the biggest thing for you playing Rasmus. Lies in its ability to turn Rasmus's pressure from a circle into a solid line of the field, cutting off passing angles and forcing mistakes that goalies are unable to come back from. The key thing to note is your active role as a body on the field. Dubu can't pass down here because I'm in front of the goal, he can't pass to his midfielder Era because I'm directly marking her thanks to my increased speed from Whiplash beating her to the goal, and begrudgingly, he has to pass straight into the Luna ult and also into my own ult towards Zentaro, who has no hope of receiving the ball. Now, can I just say, this, uh, season one, my Zentaro hater arc, you can't get edgier than a Zentaro who is bullying, uh, who is bullying, I don't know who is the goal in this situation here, but she's bullying Luna, and with the name Mass Samurai. How much edgier can you get as a Zen player, dude? <laughs> but, the big thing here is, more, oh, like I said here, I'm directly marking Era in this situation here, and Zen is looking at whoever my other forward is. Okay, yeah, I'm easy the goalie in this situation, so Luna's my other forward here from just the goal mouth positioning. The fact is, even though Zen's looking at her, and she, and, and not even counting the crater, if Luna just dies without it going off, or if she just, yeah, beforehand or so, if Dubu wanted to still pass his end, I would always still get the core before he gets a chance to strike or burst with it. The fact that I'm cutting Era off means that there's really not an effective lane. So, regardless of the crater, fact is, Dev Touch gets to control the entire lane, exactly so. And that's really the crux of my point here. Recognizing your positioning, recognizing when you can steal priority, and just... It's effective game IQ, because, exactly so, since your pressure is a solid line on the field, as I say in the video, you have an effective free cut at whatever passing lane. It's all about making the enemy uncomfortable and forcing them to take a bad lane for when you are in position to get that goal right afterwards. I'll say, I'll say one funny thing. Uh, I remember that some, uh, in one of the earliest comments on this video, too, was how I point out, it's like, yeah, it's a bad situation, because I'm marking, uh, for the enemy, because I'm marking out Era. Zentaro's cut off from, uh, from passing because of my Death Touch and the Crater, and Dubu has to pass the ball only. And then somebody commented, uh, Dubu could have just pr uh, pressed secondary, held the core in the corner. And to that end, I say, oh yes, I also could have just not had Death Touch ready up at the time. Fact is, not everyone's gonna be perfect, this was season 1 days, and in this vacuum, he didn't use his ability. He didn't have it, and so he didn't press it even though he ha had a way to try to contest me on it. 
he didn't expect me to use Death Touch. And that is the main crux of it all. I was marking Era, and I had in my mind the exact game plan to just use Death Touch as a cut to the lane. So that's just effective play for me. It's not necessarily a mistake on Dubu, because that's the first time he probably saw it, and now he has to be on Danger Watch anytime I leave the lane anytime he leaves the lane open from now on. Make yourself known to the enemy goalie as an active threat on the field, thanks to Death Touch's low cooldown compared to other ultimates and its fast projectile speed. Cut off his forwards at every single opportunity that you get, both from your own good positioning and from where you strike the core to. I want to highlight my positioning back then because I thought this was the slickest back in the day when reviewing this clip. I, I remember pointing this out to myself as, holy crap, this was great because of two things. One, as you see right there, I immediately try to follow up with my era on a strike to Pendulum Swing. Of course, this is so OT at the time, but I thought to myself, if I can stun Kai, Era has a free send to try to get the core out. She still sends it on the corner to dodge Julie's strike, which is great. And then, I'm trying to set myself up for ready to receive, because if it passes up to Vice, I'm not in front of her, I'm standing behind her, so she has to dribble up, or if she tries to dribble anywhere else, I can get a second strike opportunity. But it carries naturally to me, and I remember this was funny, because I wondered to myself when I'm reviewing, how did I get so much speed? But I'm pretty sure it was both the air speed boost, and I also have glass cannon proccing, I remember, on this map, just by the little rings. But the main thing there is, once again, effective, weird plays that catches people off guard, because I don't want to dribble it down, because that's just vice territory, but I did see that with the enemy being caught off guard from their strike timing there, if I keep it cornered downwards, one, keeps Vice Roth out of the play. Since I keep man marking her, it's just going to be Aaron Juliet, who will really have the lane to go to. And then, if I can hold my position and cut them off, like I demonstrate, well, that's pretty nice and simple. ...opportunity that you get, both from your own good positioning and from where you strike the core to. Notice how I strike the core downwards into the corner after gating the barrier. Not only does this stall for time and allow the goal to fully open up, but it means that Kai cannot pass to his vice as I am actively man marking her. He has to keep it in the corner and hope to get it to his Juliet, which I can easily cut off with my death touch angle. Exactly me from the past. Because why would I try to dribble it upwards into the corner and say 1v1 me era, when instead I can keep it at the bottom right corner, and even though it's a 2v1 basically, Juliet Kai versus Era at the time, I have my angle of play, and they didn't expect it at all there, which is all that matters with Death Touch. Just that one, it's that little drag away back to the midfold from where you want to bring the core to. When looking for these opportunities, follow the same rule of thumb as Whiplash. Constantly aim for the corners to give yourself time to reposition before pulling the core back to yourself for an easy open goal. I want to highlight, uh, I, I'm, rem I'm remembering these tropes as easy to go by. Next highlight here is how orb traits are really good. I got an orb here. I immediately get hit with the Rasmus Burst trying to kill me. If I didn't get the orb, I would have died. He pendulum swings me, trying to stagger me. Not enough damage. I grab the orb. It still blinks on me to try to kill me, but the orb keeps me alive. And then I still get to run away with the entire game no matter what. Anyway, suckers. <laughs> the corner, Kai is forced out of the middle of his goal. He has to go down to answer, which gives me just that moment's notice to pull the core back of Death Touch and answer the easy open goal. Exactly. So rewinding the clip back, of course. Main thing is Drek is able to get the goal mouth going for us. He does get the hit. And then it's me trying to keep the lane away from everybody. No reason for me to pass it up top because other Asmus will just cut me off and then it just feeds to a stall, which is bad. So instead, if I put it in the bottom right where nobody is, it's going to force movement from everybody. Hey Calvin, so next year can we react to Truth's reacting to our video? I was honestly thinking about joking about that, of just keeping this yearly rewatch and seeing if how my stall goes up, and that is if I'm still making a Mega Strikers content later on, but we'll have to see. But yeah, if nobody is at the bottom, it's going to drag feet down here. I'm trying to bait the play and sell that, hey, I'm trying to drag the core low. So you can see, literally everybody in the pitch is looking at it. Whereas 
immediately afterwards, if I just catch the corner to where Kai thinks it's going to be safe to, I can get my hit right, uh, right off, keep myself safe with how low I am, and also get an easy through ball as well. It's, that's just game IQ right there, and also recognizing where I can exactly take advantage of both the state and the passing lane. Since Kai doesn't want to pass up, I'm holding that space and so is Drek. Everybody on the pitch is going down, so he's thinking, I just gotta clear this out on the corner, and then it just goes on and out. the core back of Death Touch and answer the easy open goal. Even though you can make these round-changing plays, you don't have to be a perfectionist about it. Just getting the goalie slightly out of position due to wasting an ability, or moving to an area where the goal is unprotected is enough. At the end of the day, it's not you trying to beat the goalie, it's you trying to outsmart the goalie. You can see here, I wish I, I, I wish I got to say, I, I wish I didn't finish my recording before I, I wanted to reword this in saying, it's your goal to beat the goalie in a strike war. And it's not your goal to beat the goalie in a strike war, because that's 50-50s, and that's always, it's a coin toss. You're leaving it up to your uncertainty. Instead, it's always up to outsmarting them, be it through dribbling or just through better ability day, use. This is a horrible dribble, but magnetized souls aren't the bad goal. then. But I still did leave the lane open as I trended upwards. I think I was. T I mean, it's very much so a telegraphed play. Looking at it, uh, looking at it now. But in the moment, Kai thinks I just gave up the lane for dribbling because one, I'm bad at it, which very much so did ring true. But it still was an dribbling unexpected depth test for him, and it did take touch, him out of the way. Make sure that you're wide open to receive the timing when the core starts heading your way. Because even though that wasn't a full. No, a corner to midfield drag or so, it was just enough to get him out of position still, and that's all that matters again. I, mean, I strongly advise you go into the practice tool and practice self-passing to yourself, both off the corners of the enemy goal and when you're entering the goal mouth itself. Being able to mind game the enemy goalie and force these weird 50-50 situations with your ultimate is a blessing in disguise that many people won't even consider. It gets enemies out of position, allows you to burn their own defensive abilities, and sometimes get in their head on where you're really going to pass to at the very end. I want to go back into the game tool for this at- oh, it kicked me out of practice. I want to go into the game tool on this to actually highlight uh, I feel like self-passing is a very dead art for Erasmus, unless you're playing goalie necessarily. Just because as Season 2, Season 3 has gone onwards, uh, forwards have gotten a lot better with taking advantage of, well, KO, uh, KO slash striker advantages, and being able to, exactly so, just pass back and forth to each other, rather than just having to rely on a dribble and your own ability. I just think, you know, yeah, general mastery has gone all the way up, and to that end, people, it's like, it's like, it's just something that is, yeah, very much so a lost art in my opinion. But, let's say you are a Rasmus on the goalie end or so. Biggest thing is, you'll see people at ground start, or even like, if someone's trying to dribble in the corner or so, so let's drag Julie up here. If they're trying to dribble in the corner, sometimes it's good to just hook them to drag them out of the way. If you, if you get them, then it stuns them, and then maybe you can pendulum swing to follow up, clear the core away. Or, if it's better, you can just drag the core down to you, dribble it back onto your corner. That is a horrible display. That is even worse, Cruzy. Let's not talk about that. But fact is, with a good death touch, you can easily uh, you can easily bring it back to your end here. Get your strike back on. I'm sorry, get your immediate strike back. Let me turn my cooldowns off. That way I can actually demonstrate proper drib dribbling. They can actually demonstrate proper dribbling back and forth. But when it comes to being able to steal priority and then self-pass back to yourself is big. I feel like I only see it, like when it comes to Rasmus players, I only see it for the goalies. And that's not necessarily a problem. But I highlight being able to mind game the enemy for if it's only you being able to hold the core over. Granted, you need, it's, like, it's something that you just don't see as much of course just due to the fact of... Uh, just due to the fact of when it comes to the execution... Sometimes you don't have as much space as you really think, and if you, like, I'm rusty on this exactly so, but you're seeing how I can mess it up immediately. But the biggest allure as to why I think I see Joel is doing is one, of course, you're stealing priority from the enemy, you're making sure that it's not comfortable for them, you can guarantee that you get a free dribble back and forth, or whatever that you want it to do, because then you get your 1 2 strike with your. Oh, with your whiplash recast and your red door stride, you have an easy way to then get a good one to pendulum swing corner set up for whatever it can be. So, yeah, distract it back and forth. One, if I was a better timing or if I was just a better Rasmus in general, I'd get that timing more. 
But you did my you did my point here. Being able to drag it back around, still priority, and put the uh, put the core in your team's favor is big. And also when it comes to that end as well, uh, actually generating just a little bit more energy, because especially since and since it's season three and we can actually see the energy that you have. Just every single little bit strike more, if you can dribble for a goalie to generate that little bit of energy, it means you can avoid the next hard force thanks to you having your burst and everything onwards, and that is of course very, very huge. Austin says, I still pass a lot as Raz goalie, and I feel like that's the biggest thing otherwise, because unless you're playing a speed striker, like, let's say, Kai, or even air goalie to that extent, I don't see how, like, how, like, self-passing or back-passing does come around as much, even on the higher ends. Granted, I'm not playing in customs or the comp scene, so I am just seeing a limited rank pool set or so. But this is a very in, um, important part of your toolkit that you should not sweep on as Rasmus for being able to drag the core back, play that little bit of a mind game, and force weirder, weirder interactions. The corners are your friends in these situations. They easily buy you a few extra seconds to reposition yourself, or the goalie frantically tries to waste their abilities or move in a completely different direction to cover for where the core is headed. Because lazy cores are the biggest, biggest thing that I feel. Because once again, as people get better at the game, and well, people have gotten better at the game, waiting to strike is... Of course, a mastery still, and some and in, in scene, if the course is sitting at the goal mouth, you're waiting for your tordons to come back. You're forcing the enemy strikers to make a move on you in that case, and then that's when you hit it. But a death touch should easily steal priority, as much as a pendulum swing can stun the enemy and hit the core, so on, so forth. So just taking advantage of where the enemies are in the pitch and watching where uh, where you can take advantage of everything is really what it comes down to be. Simple, straightforward straight war between you and them. Wait until you see them burn their strike when you pass it down, before hitting it back to yourself for an easy goal. But yeah, like, it looks like I kind of beefed it right there, but I was trying to buffer a better hit with my self-pass. And I still got it at the end of the day, but after I saw Kai burn his first strike, so up here, pass down, let him burn his first strike, and then the go button is right then and there. Hit the pendulum swing, pass it back, I've out mind gamed him, and I've beaten his strike shot. Just... That was exactly it. I wanted to play a mind game on him since with the goals open and we have the striker advantage, let my teammates hold the midfield line in case Kai gets a Digi Blast core in case yeah, Digi Blasted core passing through, they can cover it. It's my job to just beat him in the 1v1, and a mind game was the best tool right there. Down before hitting it back to yourself for an easy goal. Remember when I said the corners are your friends? The entire arena is your friend whenever you can get a clear with death touch. You should go into the practice tool and also find these weird angles too, as the velocity of depth touch means that you can find these clever little holes in the goalie's defense if they're out of position. Always look to find that play whenever you have your ult up. I also thought, kind of like uh, the goal mouth, uh, 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 the goalie line hat, where you hit them with pendulum swing way on the very edge. I thought this was also the next vid thing that people really should be taking advantage of is Demon Angels, which is another topic for the School of Omega Strikers that I never actually got around to covering, which I do think would be really nice, just for your, just for finding your burst angles and everything like that. Because, quite frankly, overall, I feel like unless, oh, unless you were in, like, a specific, unless you were in a specific, um, I guess, I, I don't know if the official Discord has Striker-specific sections and everything like that or so, but the main thing that I am trying to talk about here is how there is definitely angles and ways to find cool burst opportunities. I mean, I think it was Estelle's that found the insta-burst tech immediately first and foremost overall. So, oh, uh, so pretty much by all of that, they were the ones that found how to core for it plus, uh, plus press burst at the time. And from my end, being able since dev touch plus strike especially with 1-2 or hot shot, anything like that onwards, meant that the core is coming at you at a rapid pace, you could easily find that exact fast lane. And I want to highlight this, because I recognize the goal mouth as being a very important piece of terrain for just marking out on any map your positioning. And if I go back to the practice tool itself, seeing exactly so, where you are in relation to the goal mouth is very big for setting up your burst plays just in general. Because you can find exactly so those cool angles by obeying the rules that I set out right then and there. Because of course, people uh, like burst has always been something that's omnipresent on any striker's kid. So being able to recognize where you uh, where you need to put your mouse 
to find the tightest angles that were there is all that is important. So let's, let's tab back into my video here. Aim before the door mouth if you are on your side whenever you pre whenever you hit with death touch for so. So, lazy core, just about so you can see. The door mouth whining doesn't line up because it's ovior or circular, I guess, more in nature. But up to where the little black lines are here. The little black lining to denote the sides or so. That was my focal point of where you'd want to be aiming because you can always, because all the maps have terrain similar to like this or so to where you can easily recognize it and and get to see all right this is the general idea for where i need to send the core to because the core will naturally bounce on the corners one way or another and depending on just your positioning you're trying to let it bounce one two times get into your exact corner itself then afterwards of course if i go back to my video aim at the corner of the goal mount if you're at the enemy side exactly so because aim straight at the corner you can find weird wicked angles, but of course it's going to depend exactly on where you are in relation to it all. Because depending on, you can try to find tighter angles or you can beef it completely like I have right there. Oops. But just wherever you're dragging it to, a straight shot won't always get you get you the goal. Sometimes you need to bait out the strike and just a little bit of a second if you if you bounce it on the corner instead finds that nice tight angle. Of course, you could try to look for double bounces over, so if you're on your side. But the highlight for me is, of course, in the context of Rasmus, if you can drag the core away with your pendulum, I'm sorry, with your depth touch, regardless if you have a way to speed the core up, be it team party, be it one two punch afterwards or so, or what I use burst as an example for the practice tool, those are the clever angles to really mind name the goalie. Find cool demon angles to where you can force out mistakes and make them just react, huh? How the heck was I supposed to guard against that in one way or another? Once again, of course, my words may vary and you would have to try this out on different maps to see exactly what angles you could get. So I'd immediately want to go at Taiko or Night Market since they just have the natural terrain. But this is a highlight point, I feel, in my opinion, when it comes to considering how often, uh, considering how, you know, if you're looking at point Rasmus, Twitch Strike would be a amazing uh, awakening for him at all times. Catalyst, of course, is fine. I'm just looking at uh, energy gain. But ways to just get more burst opportunities to follow up after you steal priority and push everybody away from you with Death Touch. Yeah, lazy core. If I'm currently playing defense on my side of the field, I am aiming a little before the goal mouth markers. Yeah. It doesn't have to... Uh, you may not always get it every time, as I kind of demonstrated right there. But on those fringe situations, to where you did your tr you did your homework, you can see my mouse turrets are already aiming further down, but I clicked right at my corner just about here. Look at that. Right, right before the goal mouth, before the black markers, right then and there. I don't know if you can see my mouse here, sir. And right out of Dubu's reach. That is such a perfect demon angle, and it is something that you always has. To, it, it is always something you have to take note of. It's less effective the longer the range goalie experience. Fair enough, but fact is, right, it still is another tool in your toolkit, rather than just pressing burst, waiting things out, and then trying to see how things go. Because, of course, that's more reaction time, but what was the main thing that I opened up my Death Touch lesson with? Conditioning. Seeing how your opponent reacts. And if you're already pressing Death Touch to bait out a reaction, you should be, you really should have lined up what you want to do with your burst. Or your follow-up, I mean. Fact is, sometimes you need to just get that monster clear, because I remember this clip here, Rasmus Asher on Athens City, we were getting pummeled, and with my health, I had to play far out and away from where those forwards are. So if I tried to contest in the corner, I'm getting bullied out, as per my stagger. So, that's just a priority steal, and that's just opportunistic plays. Once again, just another tool in your ever-evolving ever toolkit. Meanwhile, if I'm perfectly at the midfield or I'm a little bit more forwards, I'm aiming for the direct corner right at the goal mouth itself. And you can see right there, exactly so. Priority steal One nice feature. with Rasmus. Uh, I really wish I played that twice. If I'm Priority steal with Rasmus. Instead of losing the goal barrier, steal the core back and then immediate aiming for the oh. corner. Look, look at my mouse cursor. It flits from right here 
to the corner itself. Because Ruin already has a shadow down here. I don't want to pass downwards away. I can pass natural to era. And it just bounces outwards exactly to where I want it to be. That's perfect. That's a perfect example of just using that cornering tech. I'll also highlight, uh, I remember... I remember this game vividly because this was on my road to Challenger. I remember this was a high diamond game. This person was called Broken Character. He was, I think, the last in draft for our team. He was hovering Rasmus at first too, but I had first pick on him. So I just, uh, but I had first pick on our team and I wanted Rasmus, so I took it. And then he just started emoting and complaining at me the entire time, even though we won. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess I'm breaking angels. I'm really proving how broken Rasmus is with my own experience there. But I, you don't have to vent your anger at me the entire set. We're on the same team, and we did win that game, funny enough. But I just found that experience funny. One nice feature of Death Touch is its ability to be an on-demand stun at point-blank range. Use Death Touch like this if you're not properly spaced for Pendulum Swing, or if you see a prime opportunity to just slide the goalie out of position, away from a crucial strike to save a barrier or a goal. I highlight how you can drag the goalie out of position with Duff Touch here, but I'm looking at it at a offensive angle. The mastery thing that I would note on one year later is if you are in a 50-50 strike war, if you are on top of somebody and the core's headed your way, the best thing as well is also just drag them with your Duff Touch. Not only do you stun them, but you pull them behind you so you can just keep running forwards and get core priority first. Bonus points if you have Whiplash, then you have the overwhelming size advantage to just always get your first hit afterwards, and then, well, everything just continues going on from there. But, at the time, I only got two clips from this, which was, yeah, exactly, stunning Atlas so we can get the goal barrier on this. I say two clips from me. Uh, Jigna Jorgensen, a wonderful Rasmus I remember seeing back in my like season one. I feel like I haven't seen him at all ever past that. But he does the same thing back in a different game to where he drags Atlas, another Atlas out of the way. So I just did a free send, even though I missed my dash punch as Julie because I sent it straight instead of dribbling it like an idiot. And then another one to when I was playing Fletz and uh, I mean, was banned on me, I, if I remember. Exactly so. This guy has the audacity to dribble on the corner, stun me. With pen, uh, with Death Touch, and then exactly so, push the core right at my face. Because even though I immediately strike when I'm out of hit stun, uh, it it still didn't go. So that is a very creative way to also just instead of saying self pass to myself, just stun the goalie and send it right at their feet. But that's just real, really, really funny. Yeah, yeah, Austin. Talk about goalies not not needing to be bullied anymore. <laughs> Tell that to the jet button secondary uh, twin drive Lunas who just say, "Oh, did I kill you again?" Shh. Nah, goalies deserve just as much bullying. You need to rotate your positions on the field. What you should be shooting for as our Asmus player. What makes him unique from the other strikers on the roster is the fact that his kit covers almost every single keyword featured in game. I remember when I was making this section of the video, they gave the buff to Rasmus halfway through me editing the creation list that it was also a creation after, like, like, and not just a projectile. That way it can benefit from the creation traits at the time. So I had to actually rewrite part of the script if I remember correctly. <laughs> Your first or last on the pick list, you can always index into almost every single kind of build and still come out as a very functioning striker who can excel in certain situations. But if you haven't seen my video on a very certain one yet, uh, roll the tape, everybody. Oh, Core Strike Thief and the Rasmus' treasure, my beloved. I'll let this play out for the fun. Yeah, uh, there's no secret to it. I love specialized training. It completely transforms the way you view your ultimate, and you essentially become a reverse Juliet in terms of kill pressure. 
Normally, you and the opponent would have to stand on the exact edge of the map, opening you up to the exact same cheesy tools that they're already fishing for. So, as much as I do like Core Strike Thief and the Rasmus Treasure, I actually really do think it aids horribly on two ends at the time of this recording. Uh, specialized training is out of the rotation, so no more big cheese on that end. You could still make do with just the Pummers and then Missile Propulsion, but of course, Specialized Training was the biggest threat of the build. But, my line there, opening you up to the exact same cheesy kills that you're already fishing for, Juliet's were really the only ones at the time, of course, Dash Punts being the eternal thing that took advantage of corner killing, I feel, in Season 1 days, but nowadays, Everybody is so savvy with being able to spot you standing a little too close to the corner. Let me hit you. You have Etz's, uh, you know, bull rush into immediate Etz Maximus. Hit you one, two. Use a burst for good measure three times to kill you. I had recent matches to where an Imi would take Pummers. Cyber Swipe to Glitch Pop immediately as soon as I see you at the midfield line. Because that's one into two guaranteed stuns. Estelle's as well with Piercing Shot into Rose Warp on your face with Pummers. Estelle's with Pummers! To try to take advantage of that fat, for instance. And then, of course, you know, anything more on that fat, uh, of course. Uh, Luna's with a whammy rocket into an immediate boost straight into your face. Or Dubu's with a rollout into a Tofu Fortress on your face, everything like that. People, of course, with the game's lifespan have gotten a lot better at spotting opportunities to get kills. And as a Rasmus player... You don't have to stand at the corners at any time, quite frankly. You have ways to cheat the corners with your whiplash, with your pendulums, or yeah, with your entire kit. So, already, Specialized is going to telegraph where you are going to play on the field. If you play on the corner, you are giving yourself up to say, hey, I could get dash punched by a Juliet, by an Etz, by an Asher at any time. Whereas, and whereas you still need to get the perfect angle to even hurt somebody out of the way. When instead you could just condition and say, whenever you get down to two tits of life, Death Touch kills you now. No dice. Just, like, it's a fun, it's a cheesy strategy, but unless it's, of course, Aimee's app or Atlas's lab, to where just getting bigger pulls themselves is always going to be valuable, uh, it, I feel my meme video actually does age horribly with a bad conditioning mindset, if that's all you think about. If you can find your one or two cheesy kills, of course, that's great. But otherwise, that's more to force respect on the enemy, more than how many can I get in a match? <laughs> you know, because like I said, it opens you up to the same cheesy kills, and I just realized I didn't have the entire thing up there. I hate everything. Well, I'll, I'll let it run again. Three, two, one, go. But yeah, exactly so. If you're doing playing at the corners, uh, no reason to nowadays, because you can't just get pulled and or you can't just get dash punched and die. Aster in this situation, if it was a Season 3 compared to the Season 1 for our mindset here, instead of looking at the course, he just dash punched me in the corner and I'd die. Guy here to get boss me and I'd die. Uh, Aimee could just cyber swipe me and I'd die. But of course, that's taking into account whatever could be there, but the fact is, they don't need any waiting for that to proc, whereas I definitely do. I need Specialized to even have a chance to cheese that kill, and it just doesn't go our way. And also, I still don't know how I got this kill. Dret goes invisible with Xenoquote to try to get to the core. I toss Death Touch forwards. He dies, and then his body goes underneath the map. Julie at the orb line. She could have dash punched me. Just since she didn't have, on, uh, have it on cooldown at my recording here, but the fact is I got her at the midfield orb, which was my biggest example. And then also... Rune players have always hated me in every game, and I think I inspired it off of this one, one drag from Core Strike Thief and the Rasmus' Treasure. I'm gonna be real with you here. Uh, he's trying to move up and maybe get the orb. You're at less than two tits of life. You die from across the map. I think I, I once again still have inspired the entire hatred of the Rune player base just on that metric alone. <laughs> and it, they still hold that grudge to me. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it, it, exactly so. Specialized training is a really fun trait, 
But it should not be your only win condition. It is a way to drag attention and pressure and find a new way of cheesy kills, but it puts you in just as much danger and people are a lot savvier nowadays. Take it with your peril when it does come back into rotation for your top water or for, of course, custom games. Well, have your fun with it. Every single map without fail and find these quick and easy KOs. If you have a very brawl heavy team composition, that extra damage also helps out with pulling enemies across the pit. Exactly so, Octavia seemed, uh, thought she was safe there, but she was still once again below two ticks no, of health, I'm, so I'm she's just dead in the water. Serious here. Your range goes from just at the old orbs when somebody's staggered to actually across the entire pitch. <laughs> the rune mains have never forgiven me for this, dude! They never have! They never will, it feels like, dude, they never have, and it just... It hurts my soul. It hurts my soul that they've never forgiven me for that. Oh! <laughs> all right, all right. I think I made my love for specialized training pretty clear there. Now, let's go over the rest of the awakenings in the game and see how well they pair up with Rasmus' kit and what you should be aiming for for each and every ability. Starting with Whiplash. Being a haste ability means that you can always ingest into one of the big three, but each has a different varying amount of potency. Chrono Boost is kind of nice, but it is considered a haste ability for Whiplash, not a buff, so you're not getting that secondary effect. At a minimum, somebody did comment on this, once again, after recording as well. They did some testing, and then they also clarified later on, I'm pretty sure. If I check things here, yep, on the main client, it also says haste and buff. So Chrono Boost actually shoots up in very high priority. And you get a bit, you actually get benefits from all bid three traits necessarily. Now, of course, Super Surge has been uh, has been destroyed for its force of entrance nowadays, Surge but you still get it. A little bit better, but seeing how the recast is a light hit, you're not getting as much damage as you'd be thinking. So, if you're looking for one of these in a draft, you are looking at aerials, as the added projectile cast range means that Death Touch is also getting buffed when you're taking this, not just Whiplash. So, at a minimum to that point, in my opinion here. After, after considerations, remember, this is season one when I recorded this, so I thought Super Surge would be the best, considering how season one was Brawler meta all the time back then, so any extra impact damage that you could get was really huge, and water hits still hit harder overall. Chrono Boost, I think, is actually the best out of all of these traits now, especially since, of course, Whip Blast is considered a buff. So, a, so the fact that you get the speed boost for the longest period of time and get to threaten the goalie at any time with a 1-2, basically, really, really sells the point more. And even though I actually highlight aerials as the best in slot at the time here, the extra range with Death Touch comes down to the Rasmus player, because you can easily get thrown off by what you consider to be the match range, and I still do so every now and then. I overcast abilities all the time, and Death Touch is no stranger when I take Missile Propulsion, for instance. So that's why it is kind of a choose what you will. But in a vacuum, Chrono Boost is actually the best one, in my opinion, then. Then I'd consider aerials, and then what would be Explosive Entrance now, because unless you're already getting kills and you need to deny it from like a Zen or so, uh, yeah, Explosive Entrance slash Super Surge actually falls down to the bid, uh, on the bid 3. But either way, there's still the bid 3 traits for extensions. That's all that you need. I love Chrono and Raz, says Austin. Yeah. Rasmus is a big purveyor of size awakenings. And as such, big fish, both differently, and even pa uh, power house pauldrons if you're playing Rasmus goalie. Oh, how naive I was. Only playing Rasmus forward and not goalie. Yeah, no, continues to be his best in slot are going to help him out, as this affects Whiplash, and we'll later see in Pendulum Swing as well. These help you cover a lot more range, and helps you out in just covering the field altogether, as a midfielder, and also as a bully if you're being a forward in the enemy's face. Yeah, just size traits I should have said in general. But then again, those are the only size traits about then, so didn't really think we are going to get any other Awakening well, Swast meta traits off of it. The core and somebody when you're dashing up with it. Heavy Impact I highlighted here in Whiplash. Just because it is an impact, and once again, light hits hit a lot harder back then, before I think Season 2, to where they really tuned most of those back. Means so, Brawler meta, Brawler meta. Cooldown reduction. It's pretty nice, even if it's just a light hit. And Quick Strike helps you out with your constant pressure combos. Strike, recast, strike, strike, strike. Eventually, you'll be able to incorporate Core Flip with that, with the extra energy that you are generating. That line read took me so long. Strike, recast, strike, strike. 
Pendulum Strain, Strike, Death Touch, Strike. I tried to incorporate so much more there, and I kept flubbing it, so I just said, ah, screw it, I'll write it down, I'll keep it simple. <laughs> but, no, I, like, of course, going on from now, if I had to, like, this is just me highlighting what, uh, what Awakenings worked best with Rasmus otherwise, whereas my actual Awakenings video, I think, did a better in-depth about it more than anything, but size traits are your best friend. And of course, Twitch Strike is your best friend too, considering how much Rasmus revolves around stealing priority, holding priority. Pendulum swing. Like I said, this also benefits from size awakenings, meaning that if you get any of those, well, two plus the goalie gear, if you're playing Rasmus goalie, because it actually is viable. Oh, you naive girl, Cruzy. Not recognizing that Rasmus goalie was very much so meta back in season one and still is to this day. Sorry, I said to drink my water. At big fish and both differently. As pretty good pits for just helping you at an all-round situation here. Heavy impact helps out pretty well, since you'll be striking the core and the goalie, or the core and the forward to get it past them constantly in a dream world if you're lining everything up. And as such, you'll also just benefit from the stock standard prime time, rapid fire, and even glass cannon, funny enough. As this extra speed, if you're not being focused down, will help you space yourself out to constantly land these sweet spots and never landing that light sour head. Because uh, okay, so on to that note, prime time and rapid fire, I always put high on the respect list for any character who has a stun in their kit. Just due to the fact that it's a stun, it pushes the core, so either of those would be good since Pendulum Swing, it, yeah, you do get power out of it, but it's power-wise in it being a hit and a stun from range, so that was there. Glass Cannon I valued super highly in Season 1 since it was a ticking time bomb trait, and it still is very much so. And I thought back then that being stuck in place as you cast Pendulum Swing was, the, of course, the one and biggest downside, so you had to position yourself perfectly back then. So that's why I put so much emphasis on it. I, in retrospect, I don't necessarily see why now, considering how it's just a good trait in general, but I don't think it offers itself to Pendulum Swing specifically when I could put any other speed trait there. Rasmus, I feel, is a better goalie than Ford, but that's my biased view, says Austin. I feel like, right now, honestly, he's at, like, I would agree with you, he'd be a better goalie than forward, considering how the forward pits are pretty polarizing when it comes to, because I feel with the removal of Timeless Creator from the pool, uh, creation goalies have not been as prominent as you'd expect, so Dubu has, I wouldn't say he's fallen off a cliff, but he's definitely taken a good hit to where I've seen him enough, and I've seen more non-standard goalies overall. Whereas Rasmus is, and to that end, I've seen the the punishment line really being pushed up for stagger brawling and everything like that. So having a goalie that can help you go tit for tat and keep the core safely on the other side is really nice. So the fact that Rasmus can index into, oh, once again, index into creations or any other thing is both really, really good, of course. But that's just speaking in a vacuum for, you know, what can any goalie do that can Rasmus do better? Well... He keeps a line, he has a direct stun that isn't a creation, he ha uh, that's uh, just basically, uh, it's already a ranged strike, and well, he controls a big amount of the field before it even reaches his goal mouth, is the big thing. He is a advantage pusher on that end, and I think that's really where his strength as a goalie lies in. Robin Rapid Fire top tier as a goalie, but that's just in general, Austin. That's just in general. Because of that, Tempo Swing actually synergizes pretty well in the same vein as Heavy Impact. You'll be constantly hitting two things at once, the core and a goalie, or just, you know, two people at once if you're pretty lucky in that. So you'll be constantly proccing this, and it's why it synergizes pretty well with a you know, siphoning wand if you're going for a pretty brawl-heavy composition. Ah, my greed was siphoning wand. Even though I feel it honestly should just go, go in as worst gear for Rasmus unless you are already looking at a brawl mindset. But at that point, then just take Pummers. Just take Pummers and have bigger drads with uh, your death touches at that point. Because the fact uh, cause the fact is, with Pummers, you get a little bit extra push for your Pendulum Swing at that point then. You already have uh, a little bit more pull when somebody is started with your death touch. You don't need to be doing extra damage, but I always bought into the mindset of I can fight people with attrition. And once again, uh, a light hits dealt a lot of damage back then. So being able to stop people from regenerating and, you know, set out a little bit more life steal from any ability was just really good. But I just put that back alongside uh, heavy impact at the time, I remember.
Grand Prix is probably still better? No, without a doubt. If I had to rank Rasmus traits, I'd probably go... I'd probably go, like, just in uh, top-of-the-line order. Switch... I'd go with Switch, Pummers... Actually, I think I'd just keep it, yeah, Uri in that order. Switch, Pummers... Mad Soas Vicious, I'd put together, and then Siphoning. Switch is always Switch, even with the nerfs, it's Switch. You can't say no to that. Hello, Aure. Pummers, you open your way to get advantages from, of course, KOs, but that's because uh, you spot anybody in the corners. Like I said, corner spotting for a pendulum swing that catches people off guard. Your Death Touch has a lot more kill range now when it comes to for when somebody is staggered out. Vambrace allows you to brawl back and forth, that's more dependent on composition. Magnetize depends on composition, I feel, more than anything. And then Siphoning, you're not... Uh, you have AoE on two out of three of your abilities, but you have to land sweet spots anyway for Pendulum Swings, and you don't want to only be using your Whiplash for damage, so it is a little bit weaker on that idea. But if you have a KO team comp, then it comes down Finally, to that. But that was Brawler meta when I made this, so yeah. I will always advise, once again, for specialized training, Extra special again is always going to be pretty nice for you, so you'll never turn that down in a good situation. But the unique thing about Death Touch is that two patches ago, when this video was recorded, uh, Death Yeah, Touch there we go. I answered your highlight that uh, Death Touch got the creation tag on there. Out, but if you miss and it settles onto the field, it is now considered a creation, meaning that you can actually index this ability into two different build paths. You can go for Timeless Creator, Monumentalist, and both, uh, not both differently, cast the last. If you want to be able to leave this on the field and just be a lingering presence, a secondary pass, opening you up to just get in the goalie's face and really force the forwards to have to pass in awkward situations or straight into your own ult. But I do come with this as a word of warning. Make sure that your passing lane is open and nobody is in between you and your depth touch intercepted. If people see you taking this in the opening draft, it's going to be pretty obvious what your game plan is, so just a word of caution if you try to do this. I wish I got more clips of people actually denying me, because I got two clips I remember during this recording, but I scratched them. I said during the recording, during the recording process of peep of me hitting the tour with death touch, but then people just getting in the way of it and cutting off the angles. And of course, that is the counterplay. But that is, of course, when Erasmus puts it out early and telegraphs his intentions through his awakening draft there. So just, that's just better. Uh, it's just understanding the flow of play and being able to find better situations rather than just putting it out there and saying, I can still control, but it leaves it open for just an easy lane cut and everything. It's just like any other passing lane you have to obey it as. I think I just put, if I remember, I just put these here to just really showcase how the creation trade can go off. But I don't put as much stock in them unless you're playing on a congested map like Tycho or Imes. Because it's just a denial trait in a way or so. But you're using Death Touch to cut the core immediately as it lands. Not to have it be lingering, because that's kind of a little bit more useless. And you don't have a way to pull enemies in otherwise unless you knock them in with Pendulum Swing for whatever reason, you know? Now... The other outlying pits on this list here are Missile Propulsion and Deadeye here. Deadeye helps you out pretty well, actually, funny enough, if you're trying to save the core from far away, as in, like, like tossing it when you're on the defense and then you move up to the midfield. As before overtime, this is the strongest hitting ability in the game. If you can get Death Touch to impact the core with such speed from 600, you know, meters or whatever unit of measurement or what a Mega Strikers is measured in. <coughs> This gets you a huge speed buff, helps you get across the map, and if you were practicing those weird demon angles on the corner of the enemy's goal you're mount, you are guaranteed a goal if they are not expecting it. As such, Missile Propulsion also helps you out in this escapade in being able to reach pretty much across the entire pitch. The weird thing about it is that this helps you in one of two, uh, in, well, two ways. If you're playing it with specialized training, you get specialized training for 55%, you know, power. Missile Propulsion adds another 15, and then Pub Wars adds another, you know, 15. So now you are looking at 85% extra power and not fat, uh, well, not fat. And this is ridiculous for Boeing at point blank range. It actually is hilarious with how much you are pulling enemies now. But if you do miss, well, your Death Touch is way across the field now. So word of caution be warned. Whatever you're using Death Touch for, if you're looking to pull somebody, make sure you are guaranteed getting them. If you're looking to save the core, make sure you have that clear lane, 
and that you are going to hit the car on the way there. Because missing it, uh, that stinks to see it lingering there across the field. Yeah, nah, I, I think I just covered every every base there that I already said here. You don't want to have it lingering, even though it is funny. Unless I guess you're the goalie and you need to just cover the lane when it comes to here. Defensively, I guess it can linger, but you, like, when you're making proactive plays, you just want to get the core and get the, uh, get priority before the enemy can react when it comes to. Getting all the side traits and death touches is always funny. It is funny, but I do think there's better traits. But if, you, if you're forced out with any uh, with other stuff, it's still not bad without a doubt. You want to piece together the Erasmus' kit, but I'm going to show a few- I've managed to hit the other goalie before range buffs are, uh, are nuts. That's what I used to do on Atlas' lab, season 1 back then. Missile Propulsion, and then it's just really, you fish, see who you get, even if it's the goalie, you- Alright, uh, cause that's a Missile Propulsion Death Touch, that's really a third of the health bar. You detonate the Gravity Core, that's another third. And then you just have to hit them with Whiplash or Pendulum Swing back then, and then they're dead. Doesn't matter, even if they're the goalie and have a little bit more, you know, a little bit more uh, HP due to goalie leveling and everything like that. You just kind of blow them out of the water. Two video examples of how all these abilities can work in tandem to make your presence known from across the field. Back when I was editing the Master Crossing segment here, I remember, I didn't think about putting the ability icons and just letting it speak for itself, but from a beginner's side, I wanted to help everybody understand once again how how you can like how you should be using your abilities in tandem with each other. And actually, this was one of the last clips I did record as well in my segments here to where I did still priority with Pendulum Swing to let it bounce back to me. Exactly so, was my entire hope. So, that should have been in the Pendulum Swing section, but I already completed it at the time, almost just about, so I just said screw it, whatever. And that sums up my knowledge and tips for you on how to play Rasmus in Omega Strikers. Good job, Cruzy Bat then. Good job. Of me practicing my favorite character here, you can check out my Twitch stream at Twitch. Look up at the link. TV slash CG Cruzy. I know I put it right down here too, but also just. Hopefully more videos in the future, or even more highlight reels of me finding stupid awakening combos like specialized training. Oh, I never did that, but I did upload a lot more videos of Omega Strikers. Always, wherever you are, wherever you may be, whether you're on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, or more, it's been your wonderful windmaid, the cruise ship captain, Strikers Pratsy, ever at your service, and thank you for watching this till the end. Yeah, how many Omega Strikers videos do I have now? Uh, 360, almost a year's worth if you just watch videos by themselves all the time or so. Wow, Cruzy, that's a lot of videos that you've put out on Omega Strikers here. That is both very sweet and also very sobering to think about. But overall, just that is wonderful to see how I got the, uh, how a lot of my information I feel actually still holds true. And then of course are lots of improvements I feel I could make to the content that is, but that's two, three seasons afterwards. It's like any MOBA, nothing's ever gonna stick. Only, uh, but the mastery of everybody will, of course, continue to get better over time. But I feel I did a pretty good bang up job at the video back then. Yeah, check out the Twitch stream, guys. Thank you, Austin, for the helpful plug overall. But I do think I did push the mastery bounds for Erasmus a good bit back then. I don't know what my entire community impact is, but considering how I had a lot of people voicing out their love for the video, how it helped them to teach more, and how I got a lot of other tips from people who are like, yeah, Rasmus Story mains, for instance, or also echoing how to better take advantage of things like, yeah, the whiplash size, Pedrome Swain's defensive properties, everything like that. I feel that improved my own play, and hopefully it improved a lot more people out of the 8,000 that viewed it overall. 
I'm very, very happy with how that editing and how everything went together. And I wouldn't be opposed to making OS guides in the future, but just with my current priority list, it's not really up on there. But still, one whole year from earning this wonderful boy and getting almost 1 million experience with him overall. It's still pretty nice. But that's my retrospective on it. And I'd say I did a wonderful job once again. Hopefully this will make good content for you YouTube guys. Because uh, 1 hour 34 minutes going on 35. So I'll stop the recording on this end, but I'll go on my Twitch stream afterwards here. So for you YouTube people, wherever you are, wherever you may be, whether you're on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, or more, it's been your wonderful win made this time around. Your true ship servants, Chargers, Proxy, ever and always at your service. Thank you for what is one year of constant Omega Strikers content that I've been able to put out and support from your guys' end with the constant views that you're giving me. The fact that out of a week, Three or four out of my seven weekly videos are breaking 100 after, you know, a week of viewing and everything like that or so. And I'm already getting at least breaking up to double digits within a day or two of just the daily Omega Strikers videos is so sweet, so nice. I am a variety streamer, of course, so I would wish that my the other stuff of mine got a lot more views. But I can't complain because at the end of the day, this is what got me the fame. And I'm pretty proud of it at the end of the day. So, thank you again, everybody. And here's to... Well, the life of Omega Strikers. Well, on with this game, and thank you all for coming on by. But for you Twitch viewers overall or so, uh, the main thing that I do want to talk about is exactly so, just... I'm still going on. I'm still going on with content and everything. Ooh, that's an Insta Q-pop. Well, start the recording for YouTube then. Good work, Cruzy. Yeah, I'm very, very happy with how that video very much so went. Just once again, overall for all the viewers that I got and everything, and well, the reception I have gotten to it, because I do get residual comments on it on YouTube, and just once again, on my regular videos themselves, with how people keep praising me on that end. Ooh, Demon Dice. Demon Dice Twitch Strike Seeds Machine. There is interesting traits all around here. Well, I do feel like I'd like to hold on to the energy gain, and I could go a Creation Striker one way or another. But, I think it'll be much better to hold on to things otherwise. I think for with Twitch Strike though, get Etz out of the lineup. Vice of course could be a pitch, cause, just because it's Demon Dice, but I think Rasmus would be better. Well, in that case then, I'm looking at Vice probably or so. Is my immediate thoughts. Because Twitch Strike is fine for me to bash back and forth. I just want to be able to keep the offensive pressure on since we have uh, Fini on the roster here. So I'm going to hold Siphoning and see if we can't get advantages. The question though, of course, is do I go Seeds Machine for the extra power toward hits or Quit Strike for the energy? I think energy, energy, energy. They have now, so I think Siphoning is the right pick here to try to contest a little bit more. But we'll have to see how things go. Uh, Switchies, Switchies all around. Strike Shot Fini. Pretty standard or so, but it's going to come down to my Twitch Strike versus theirs is what I think it comes down to be. So let's let's see what we can or cannot get. Very, very good pass out. Oh, I thought it would come back around the lane there. So just trying to play smart. Now what? Uh, now, oh, that's a horrible passing lane. Sorry, that's on me. That's on me. At least got to clear it out in a way, though. So, Trent's about to Aimee, huge, cut the lane with my power toward in case, but Aimee got it better. Alright, 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 all good, all good, all good. Look, I, I passed it back up to now by accident, but we still got first touch advantage and we were able to build off of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying keep it up, Kappa, just once again, thank you for the love. Again. Trying to keep Asher pressured out and about here. I was hoping that if I tapped one of them, then maybe we could really get something drilled out and going on there. I'm just gonna eat the... What's his face? I'm gonna eat the creation. That way they are cut off. I, I, that way it's an open lane for Fini to potentially go to right there was my thought process. Oh, the fact that I got nothing going. Really, really good big finish. 
That's a huge priority steal. The fact that I didn't hit Aster at all there really, really hurts. Nope, this was zoning more than anything here. But if I can potentially get Eras burst out, that's all that I want in the world right now. Good burst. Okay, Era burst out. That's very successful, even if the gold barrier has not gone out yet. Watch the top. Really nice stuff. Oh, if I got the cut, that would have been huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a little, just a little hard, a little hard. It wasn't the best afterwards with uh, now one C point in. She just man marked me out. So good play by her. Good play by her. The one thing I am recognizing is that I'm not actually going to get to control energy that well, considering how Twitch Strike is going to be generating so much energy naturally for everybody otherwise. I didn't know if Arrow also was in the game yet, so I was trying to decline doing anything and help wait things out. Rough. Trying to drag the enemy out in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now it just generated way too much energy there. My zoning Thunderstruck wasn't necessarily the best. It didn't clear it to their side. So just shore that up. But we don't have any immediate uh, 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 offensive awakenings. I mean, I guess there is uh, projectile range. But it's not actual projectile power is the problem here. So we need to find a way to really generate anything past that. Because otherwise, their speed will just keep beating us out is what I feel. Oh, I tried stealing the orb and it came to nothing. And instead then, just get in front of Astra so she can't get a dash. Trying to disrupt them. Clear the lane down. Ooh, bad cut by me. Just trying to get my burst here so we actually have a lane of offense is the main thing. Immediate hit. Oh, finny moment. All right, all right. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. Just rough for us, but if we can get some offensive traits, I think it'll be big. If there's any stagger traits around, I think we're going to be really locked out here. But we'll just have to see how things go. Hmm. Not much here, honestly, for us to really get our game plan going. I don't like this at all. I think this, benef this draft benefits the enemy way more. Yeah, Pete for Asher lets her get away with so much here. And I, of course, do not appreciate that at all. I think for me, Perfect Form would necessarily, uh, would honestly be the best. A General Rush would let me potentially have resets, but we get a striker advantage where don't, we have the range, whereas the enemy has to put their face onto everything here. For me, otherwise, it's just all about getting things started to begin with overall. Can I tap my ability, please? Oh, I thought I could hold the end, dude. I missed every single one of my abilities, and now it's back at full health, just about. All right, good control, good control. Nope, I was trying to, I was trying to stay respectful right then and there. Cut the top. Just a little too far in my teleport. It's okay. Oh, this is a difficult send. Oh, that's such a difficult send. I send it down trying to get to Imi and uh, it cuts to the Maelstrom. Oof. Oof. It's not the best. It's not the best. All right. It's fine enough, though. The fact that I kind of whiffed everything after first touch and everything more really sucks. But I can't say much more than that. Instead, keep controlling what energy I can here. Nice stuff. Good core pushing. I can't believe we didn't actually lose a dual barrier on that yet. I mean, he's unfortunately dead. Trying to stay calm on this end, but that speed's absolutely gonna wreck our shit. Oh my goodness. Yeah, just a little bit too much speed, and the fact that Asher literally got a best in stock of peak performance on that draft, whereas we don't have any offensive traits, it's just core control, no power behind our hits. Really, really sucks, dude! But that's just, that's how drafting can go. I'm not getting to control the energy game like I wanted to, like I said before. Which is the biggest problem. But if I can find taps right so, then that's what it all comes to. Just 
tried finding a trap there. You need to press the reverse button and just force the situation out of Asher exactly. Good. Trying to get it down to Aimee as soon as possible here. Good hold. There you go. There you go. All right. It finally it took a kill and a little bit more. Unfortunately, we couldn't get Asher's burst, which I think is still going to secure the uh, set for them. But we gotta keep pushing it. We gotta keep pushing it. At least perfect form will continue to get my abilities going. If I get hits, of course. We'll have to see how things necessarily go. No cut. Trying to stay in behind. I might have stolen the orb from Aimee, which I think is detrimental. Very big. And yeah, just came to, like I said, Asher just got it, unfortunately. So rough. Rough, 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 rough. Their speed is overwhelming us. Here. There is finally traits for us to potentially take. Senior and explosive entrance are both here. Hmm. Well, she took explosive, so I'm taking Stinger in that case. I was the I I think I was gonna take explosive first and foremost myself, but Asher's denying that from me, which of course is the biggest thing. But we do actually have offensive traits that can work here. It's just you know we'll have to see if there's anything much more to get out of it. Fact is, I I do have a win condition on the table here. I don't have best in slots, but I do have ways to cause disruption and maybe get a standard advantage going, which is what matters. Now we're going to use her one and only uh, evade, so I'm just going to press the core on her face exactly so. Alright, good lazy core. Well, the fact is, my teammates got the evade out, and then I could just press the button. So that, that is what matters right then and there. And even with that full cast hitting them a lot, you can see the pressure that we could potentially have on them. But that's, that's, uh, that's one round. We need to keep this momentum up. Oh, horrible dribble. I'm actually gonna die straight up here if I'm not careful, so I have to play have to play super respectful. Didn't get a cut that I wanted, and that is just bad. Yeah, if it gets to our side, we start drowning here. And I don't have a good dislodge unless I have my ult, so that's really the problem. Cause they just get core control and they run with it. Because it's just impossible to dislodge otherwise. Do have my ult this time around though. So I'm just I was about to say, I'll tap and see what I can get out of it. Oh, we can't be losing barriers like that. Alright, that's a really, really nice chill, though. Please send it up. Please send it up, Finny. Why are we sending it down low where, where now still is? I need to know. Oh, my God. Please send it up. Help me out here. I'm trying to get it out of the way, and you just kept sending it to now. It's fine, though. It's fine. So, I cheat. It, it's it's just now move move our defensive line please send it straight just challenge era I'm trying to dribble it and I'm failing spectacularly well that's a Oh, that's a grief of a whining there. Oh, finny moment. Oh, finny moment. Steal priority. I mean, it effectively holds the corner for us. I'm he's dead. Oh, the sentry drone's huge. Nice merit. Trying to cut the top if I can. A finny moment! Oh my god! If you didn't press the big finish, we would have had it! Why did you press it on me? <laughs> I mean, first draft really screwed us, so I can't say too much more than that. And of course, now existing to help Asher just stay in the face really hurt. But come on! I, we could have at least ended that last round 2-3! Oh my goodness gracious, dude! I, you're diving enough. I'm not like what we still got blown out. There's blame enough on my end because I couldn't deal enough damage. But come on, <laughs> you really just screwed the first. Finny is a curse in this game. There's a very fine line 
I feel that separates what you can say is going to be a good Finny and a bad. And there's times when I agree very much so at playing as Finny myself, but you gotta be a lot more proactive when it comes to using your big finishes in a smart, rational way, and then just putting it out there, dude. You gotta be very proactive, not reactive with it. If it, there happens in the game, something will go wrong. I think I've seen a few videos uh, to where I've actually seen masterclasses. I don't think I've ever gotten a good masterclass in Finney myself, but maybe the states of Obscure will change it, but it can be very hard. All right, Finney's already being shadowed otherwise. We have a rune here as well, which is potentially big. So let's let's see what, what comes around. <sighs> what don't I want to potentially deal with in this case here? Nope, no wets. I'm fine with that, boys. Go right ahead. Go right, go right ahead and take him out. I was thinking ban Asher Era just because we had them in the last game, and that could be a higher priority pit to take out, and that's totally fine. Hmm. I want to go Vice. I want to be able to hold a hard force for my end. I would love to go Finny, but we need we definitely need a hard force. So I think Razzy B will just be the hold. So as much as they did want to play Finny, they were shadowing first and then they swapped over, so I'm not gonna fault them. So then switch or magnetized. Kai I me. My battle is beyond mm. this. I think I'll have to respect. Because we have rune anyway, so I respect switch. Respect switch, stick to it, see how it goes. Fact is, we have enough pressure from when it comes to on this end, so let's just see how it uh, uh, pans out. So, Mad Aimee switches on both of our ends. It is Dancer for Kai and Dubu. And otherwise, it's just, yeah, that's just special for the rest of us. So, we we need to get first, we need to grind a first uh, touch war win and everything like that to begin with here. I don't know what is my positioning here. It is very bad positioning, I'll say that first and foremost. Need to eat the hit. My whiplash timed out right then and there, but it's all right. They didn't get the best send themselves, and I am not getting my I'm not getting my way into the round here. Nice try, Rune. I literally did not get a strike going, so that's on me. If you want to send towards the portal, was my thought, but all right. Oh, that's a little dicey. So I'm trying to be a portal respecter right here. Done. Didn't get it. Playing a little too close, and close in a way. I'm just trying to get enough energy to get my death touch here. But if I can also just eat hits, that way, uh, that's his face. That way, we don't lose our barrier. That's all that I was hoping for. I don't know why you passed it up to Kai though. That is a very questionable play. The entire bottom's open, and he already used his Giga Blast. First, we have burst too. I mean, I saw you use power cord, so you didn't have a chance to burst. But like, that's questionable. Very, very questionable. Well, nice banish to start, but I wasn't ready. I wasn't lined up to help, unfortunately. So that's a bit on me. That is, uh, very stupid for me overall. But it's fine. Trying to drag down to where Rune can play the core. Good movement by Kai to try to start moving on. Now I can be a second strike player. Or not a strike player at all. Horrible gameplay by me. Absolutely abhorrent gameplay by me. Stagger Kai out, because we can press the advantage on him. And then try to watch the wide angle! Ooh, nice stop gapping by Dubu there. Ah, uh, did I just screw the pooch? That is on me. That is on me. I pressed Whiplash just thinking maybe I could disrupt Kai's barrage, but instead I just pushed him right into uh, Asher. All right, all good, all good, all good. That is my own grief in that end, so fair play. Yeah, sucker, how, how do you like that? How do you like them apples? Trying to hook Dubu out of position. Exactly so. So we can just get the advantage brewing. Double stun. Perfect. Good cut up top. Ah, uh, I was about to say, we need to be portal respecters. Ah, 
Find the cut. Huge. Demon and Yoin. Great, 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 great. Sim simple enough. No, Yoin's open. I'm trying to see if they want to pass to the towards the portal before I toss the dev touch up or below. And then I just caught Kai on the side right there. After reviewing uh, Captivating, that's exactly what I wanted out of every out of all my hits there, funny enough. Surprised that the banish didn't get shit. We still lost the we still lost the barrier at the end of the day though. Oh! <laughs> Double burst really sucks to see. But it had to be done right there. Just about. Watch where Ami wants to send. Oh, I, the fact that I didn't get Kai with that really, really sucks. Okay, a little bit more offense considering we are all uh, extra special is really what it comes down to be here. Because we're finding good hits on Kai when he wants to press the face, but otherwise we just need to watch our line is what it comes to. So what is the immediate thought here? Kai could take Ponder if he wants both traits. He's taking prime time on that end then. So probably for me, it's just got to be prize fighter or adrenaline rush is my thoughts here. I'm probably thinking prize fighter, considering how I want to have a little bit more power on all my hits, and that does get, you know, a condition going for us. And Rune took adrenaline, so fair enough. If he can find his cornering, that would be great. But it's gonna be the Kai game. Kai game, Kai game. I mean, he's finding good firewall sentries to really push it, but it's Kai just running away with it, of course. So if I can, if I can get the game going, of course, with any big hits and all, that's what it comes to. I tried stalling the gameplay right then and there. A little unfortunate. I need to drag Kai out of the way because I'm, I'm I'm giving I'm giving him all the room to just get to one v one Imi with one v one Vice, which is not what we want in any retrospect at all, of course. Good cut, Rune. Drag Dubu, kill him. Open goal. Just watch where Kai is. Alright, good, 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 good stuff. Alright, I got a prize fighter stat. That was a really, really nice cornering by Rune into Vice just getting open with her uh, Thunderstruck into Supernova. And we got a good advantage off of it. So let's, let's keep brewing here. Let's keep idea brewing. I'm just going to respect the portal. And that is the worst death touch of all time but that's another cornering kill by kai trying to get frisky so i'm very happy with that outcome oh why am i lagging why am i not respecting space either dude drag the core give it to me huge well i mean with that so that's also huge push the core Great! Whiplash range, whiplash range. Alright, alright, alright. Way better, way better. Yeah, kill condition is on here, so we're getting things going. We're getting things going. And that's another time that I've caught Kai on the corners when he's trying to push his advantage with his blazing pace and, uh, just face. Yeah, with blazing pace and... What am I trying to say here? Barrage is the keyword. Trying to just press the burst button and keep pressure on, because you're seeing I'm res I'm just residually hitting Imi every chance that I get here to keep her as low as possible, and I'm trying to drag her as well. You didn't necessarily get the hits that you wanted, but the fact is, we still did get the barrier, which is what mattered then and there. I'm gonna greed for the orb and then just trend towards the portal, just because with how low I was, I just. Wanted to stay comfortable in my own skin, and then nice, 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 nice. Just, dude, I, Rune, and Vice are finding their link up plays to really get into the game here. So I am very, very happy on that end. And if she can get explosive entrance or even stinger, this game's over, I feel. And it could very much still be over, even heavy impact. Yeah, I'm gonna take stinger, and then I'm just gonna say, what are you gonna do about it, enemies, at that point then? Otherwise, it's just gonna be bulk, and I'm just gonna say, die. Yeah, gimme Stinger, gimme Stinger, let me make the forwards life horrible, considering I have prize fighter to prop that even faster. Oh, baby, we we are turning this around. What's that rune? Yeah, Kai still gets speech, but Stinger's gonna nullify that enough, if I can find my hits, of course, on him still, and we'll just have to see how things go. 
Lagoon's did really good rotations out, and Vice is finding her ways to get into the game. Which is all that we could ever hope for. I'm just trying to find ways to eat hits and make sure we stay in the game. I'm trying to drag Dubu into the Vice ult was my... Was my hope right there. Just didn't come out, of course. Good Pendulum Swing. Drad Kai. Because that's his problem that he has to deal with. Just hit him. Made sure that it's still hard for him to want to play the game. He's still got an orb. It's fine. We're still pull, pushing, pulling, getting everything going. And that's just a little bit of a little bit of power that I needed on my strikes overall. Pendulum Swing didn't get the stun. Got what I wanted, though. It's gonna be a burst play, ain't it? Or just Rune getting an amazing banish, actually. Because Aimee didn't have her blink at the end of the day, so we got to drag it out. Nice stuff, dude! Really good tempo on that end. Alright, I got my prize fighter stat. I got to drag Kai to the depths and below. So, that's all we can really ask for! I tried keeping a water roll cut right there, just didn't work. Nice defensive merits. Really, really nice defensive merits. Holy crap. Good spacing by me. Keep the pressure on Kai with the whiplash cast. Didn't draft him to his death yet. I'm out of cooldowns, unfortunately. Unfortunate. so hard if I just had a little bit more power or if I staggered him earlier. Uh, nice, nice play by Aimee to cut the bottom half there considering Kai just got to run a train on Vice and I. If I just had a little bit more power. Just a, just a smidgen more power. Ooh. That is so tough and me lagging does not help our onus on the play either. I was about to say, if I, if I could cut if I could cut Kai right there, that would have been the biggest play of the century. Instead, drag up and around was what I was hoping to do there. Rune portal respecting did not go the way we wanted it to, but my portal respecting will. Need to eat the Dubu hit. Nice barrage, nice barrage. Alright, alright, alright. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, we're just not getting enough damage, nor is Vice finding enough situations where she can really lay the pressure in on Kai afterwards. She's trying to land her hits, but Kai's just speedy around if he gets a core hit, and then it's just impossible to dislodge him, just about. Which is where the inline problems are, because yeah, we're trying to constantly find these angles to where we can link everything up all together, just about, but it's just not coming to! I'm surprised I didn't die there. Yeah, Kai has all of his dodger back. Good pendulum swing cut by me though. Here. And get it as soon as the goal opens down below. Tempo, tempo, tempo. I need to push it because I got my burst. Keep things moving. We need to just get things as cut as possible. Because since we already used all our specials, this an extra special idea span for us. And keep the line moving. I missed my stride. That should have been should have been huge. Why am I lagging? Why am I lagging, dude? I should not have been lagging there at any metric at all. But huge play rune. Nice try, nice try. Oh, I how did I not go through the portal there? How didn't I go through the portal? That's so unfortunate. Alright, fair enough. It's a close, it's a close, really close round and set. The fact that Kai absolutely did kill me. Really set that in stone, unfortunately, but what more can you really say? Kai will probably just get a CDR trade, unfortunately, when it comes to... Hmm. Right? He's taking aerials. I think I want reverb, because Stagger did kind of be a little bit... Uh, no, was a little bit of a problem for me there, unfortunately, at the end of the day. But I want to be able to contest a little bit more on the power side when it comes to... Rune's getting a uh, Chrono Boost, so that'll be his extension to his banishes that he's been getting. 
So we'll just have to see how things pan out. The fact is, I want to bat a little bit more here. Horrible, horrible carry by me. Nice tries. At the very least, we were able to cover on the corner ends. Yikes. Yikes, 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 yikes. Because as soon as it starts to rain, it starts to pour. I lazy core, lazy core. If I uh, instead of putting the pendulum swing at the top portal, I should uh, the death touch at the top portal. I should put it at the bottom. That way it rebounds to me. Otherwise, I think that's the adjust. Why? Why am I lagging? Hello, game. Oh, game. Why must you do this to me? Find my angel. That was an idea, but it's still fed to me. Hello, hello. I found a death touch one way or another. Yeah, why am I lagging? I don't have anything else open now. I do have Steam open, I guess, but I mean, it's just the Steam homepage. So what more can I really say about it? Oh, I, dude, I, okay. That was just me. I just clicked out of the browser there. That is a kill. And get a prize fighter stacked out of it. But it still is a kill. That is an advantage to work off of. Aimee has her burst, which is horrible, of course, so she's just going to timing it. Mm, yeah, just simple enough play by her there. The fact that we couldn't control it away from her because she got the barrier for free. Me having my spikes ain't the best. Or me, uh, the browser ain't the best either, but it's just, ah! But really, like, we, we, we just need to find a way to link back up with, uh, with, uh... With Vice here, considering how... Like, she wants to find her jet buttons in, but Kai is making her so uncomfortable otherwise. Which is the everlasting problem. I'm just trying to get energy for my... What's his face? I'm trying to get energy for my burst here. Uh, I'll just get the orb. Or ruin to just steal the orb from me when I wanted it, dude! I just want the orb! I, I need to get this little bit of energy, please! Send it down. Beef, 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 beef. Great. Okay, good stuff. Good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Dude, I was on a tip of energy the entire time there. But the fact that it's game point means I had to spend the burst. And at the very least, Dubu whiffed his. That's the big part. Rune and Kai are just going to be contesting for energy and everything onwards, though. So, this is just where the game comes to. Okay, that's... That's big, but the fact that no plays are coming to it... It's so risky! Huge. I didn't get a cut. I mean, can though. Ah, dude, I keep, I keep glitching back and forth and it's annoying me, but fair play to the enemy. I, I was finding some impact, but really, Vice was just so uncomfortable. If I peeled a little bit farther back, maybe I could have helped out on the defensive line, but unless she found a way to, unless Rune found a good banish, or just a good cornering like we saw in set 2 there, it really fell out of our way. Which sucks, but, like... We just couldn't link up. I think that's more of just our composition issue. We, I didn't have a way to really hold Kai honest. And Aimee mean, just, you know, could push the offensive pressure more than Rune could at the end of the day there. So, hmm. It, yeah, it just was the Kai problem at the end of the day. Just trying to think about what else should I really have done. Because really, like, like, really, like, Vice was doing her best, but... I saw that like whenever she found her comfortable ways to press a jet button, she could drown some base out and maybe get our advantages going for Druin to get a adrenaline rush reset or so. But Druin himself, besides getting a banish or so, he didn't have anything saved to get cornerings or to pu help push the damage and for me to get prize fighter or for him to get more adrenaline rushes. His banishes, if they missed, they missed. If they did hit, it was always in a reactive sense, I feel, but I'm nitpicking, I'm nitpicking. Fact is, we still lost. And we just couldn't, we couldn't stop Kai from getting a flow in, which is the biggest thing. I tried my best, but I did drown in the strike wars against him. So the best thing I could then do is just absorb Aimee pressure and then try to define drads, but that really didn't come to at the end of the day. Just, we had to unlock Vice, but with Kai's speed, we just couldn't.
but it's all right. Rip. Yeah, that's it. It's a really rough match to go uh, to lose on that end, but like, it was a drown. It was just drowning of light. I recognized Kai was the problem, even with me trying to focus him down. He got a best in soccer with Peak, and then it's just hard. It's hard. It's hard to keep going onwards there, dude. It didn't feel good at all. And it's just, wah, wah, you know? But it's fine. With it being 1027, I've been going for two hours more. I'm, I think I'll give it one more game and then we'll call it here, depending on queue time. So I do want to get my rest. I've got another morning shift onwards and everything more tomorrow. So we'll just see how things go. Besides, I have uh, the captive. I have the captivating vod to edit out anyway, so we'll just see how things go. But I know uh, this coming week is going to be a very p prospective one. So I think I'm going to be streaming less all on uh, week of July 15 through 21 here. The only ones that I, and the only streams I know for a fact I do want to line up at the very least is Valhalla with Ayn on Thursday night like usual. And then I have VCAT on, uh, what's his face, on the weekend. So Saturday, Sunday, and then basically VCAT's going to take up all of my streams onwards for me to explore, have fun around, and just go either by myself or with friends. For whatever I can set up, of course, when it comes to here. Because I want to enjoy it. It's it's a V it's a V chat as always. And what more fun is there? But I know I've got, I think, like longer shifts for the week as uh, as we go on. So I'll just point by ear once again on how I'm feeling energy-wise and and everything, you know? I'm also seeing how low my water thermos is. Yeah, uh, one second, I'll give it to five minutes. If I get a game, I'll call it my last one unless it's an emergency and we get bombed out 03. Otherwise, I'll, I'll call it there. Yeah, let me check my upload schedule because that was two games that I've had right then and there, right? So that could be two more to add on. So with Captivating, that'll last me till almost just about July 22. So I'll have a week of buffer, but I'm still trying to get that to be a month of buffer for when I potentially go on vacation in September later on. So pretty good start, all things considered here, but there's still a lot more work to constantly be done on my streaming side, of course. Let's see here. Uh, type these out. Do I want to post that Rasmus game? It was, I mean, it wasn't the worst ever. I am going to post the last game, though, just because Finney moments really screwed the pooch there, and I think that's pretty funny, all things considered. But, uh, I'll, I'll see how I'm feeling about that one. Well, no, 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 I, I think I'll post it out, so let me type it on my spreadsheet. Rasmus Gates, and then the other one was... Shoot, I'm really forgetting what it was. It was Demon Dice. It was Rasmus Demon Dice too, right? Pretty sure. No, no, I played Vice. I played Vice because it was uh, it was Asher right there. All right, typed out. Simple enough. We hit five minutes on cue, so I will just go ahead and call it there for tonight then. And wherever you are, wherever you may be, whether you're on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, or more, it's been your wonderful win made your cruise ship servant. So our cruise proxy ever and always at your service. Thank you everybody for joining me on the retrospective of Captivating today. But otherwise, I'm just going to take it easy, not going to push myself too much once again. I got morning shifts. I want to be able to edit things out and then just rest on this note. So, once again, whether it be morning, afternoon, evening, or night, at least from my side of the world, have a good night, everybody, and thank you all for coming by again. Uh, on my schedule for streaming, Variety Night is put out to be on Sunday, so I'll just see what I'm feeling, and then we'll just go on from there. But once again, at least for now, have a good night, everybody.